guys, for a long time I've been thinking about and planning on doing where I talk about my entire DVD and Blu-ray collection. But because there's kind of a lot of movies back there, this is going to take a long time, so I've been delaying and delaying. But the day has finally come where I'm going to talk through the entire thing. Now, before I get started, I want to kind of preface this with three things. First off, I started collecting movies and DVDs and stuff back in the 90s. And so I had a lot of VHS tapes because they'd sell them for like a dollar a piece back when they were transitioning over to DVD. In which case, I've got hundreds of VHS tapes tucked away in boxes somewhere. Second thing to keep in mind, uh, just short of 10 years ago, I got robbed and I had about 200 DVDs stolen from me. So this would be even larger if not for that event taking place. Third thing is that people have borrowed a lot of movies from me and not returned them and I've lost a lot of movies. So you'll notice as I go through this video, there's no Rocky movies listed in here. I own all the Rocky movies. I actually own multiple copies of all the Rocky movies, but there's none of them in these stacks back here behind me because they've gone missing somewhere at some point in time. All right, without further delay, I'm about to get started with all of this. I don't actually know how many movies are back here, so what if you guys are really obsessive compulsive? Try and count the movies as I'm going through them. Tell me at the end how many movies I actually go through in this video. My guess, 287. Now, without further delay, let's get started. First up, 13 going on 30. I think it's a delightful little movie. I like Jennifer Garner, Mark Ruffalo, Andy Serkis is in there as just a human character. It's just a fun take on a, you know, a 13 year old turning 30, kind of the modern, uh, not, not modern anymore because it's 15 years old, but an updated take on big with a girl character. It's just a lot of fun, pleasant, charming, everything about it I kind of like. I don't really have anything negative to say about it. And every time I rewatch it, I'm like, I need to rewatch this a lot more often. However, 27 Dresses, uh, Catherine Heigl, romantic comedy that, um, yeah, I, I think I've kind of seen it. Catherine Heigl's pretty unpleasant, not particularly charming. She's not one of the Jennifer Garners of the world. So I, I frequently walk in with my wife watching it and, um, don't pay attention. It's got James, uh, was it Masters in it? Masters, the guy that's always the other guy and stuff. So he's in it. So he's kind of nice. I kind of like him. But as for Catherine Heigl, not so much. Next up, 500 Days of Summer. A real fun, neat little um, take on breakups and relationships and how they kind of affect you. I, I really enjoyed it. And it's kind of the right movie at the right. It's, it's, it's a type of movie that captures a certain feeling and emotion and kind of a certain vibe of the dating culture at a specific point in time. This is kind of those movies that resonates with a lot of people. I really enjoyed it. And um, uh, because of this movie and because of the chemistry between Andrew Garfield and uh, Emma Stone in the Amazing Spider-Man movies, I want this guy to go and make a movie with those two um, as a romantic comedy, them at the 30s, different phase of life, different phase of singleness and things like that. I think that would be like a nice spiritual cousin to this one because they had such great chemistry. Though the movie they were in was or movies they were in together weren't so great. Next up, About a Boy. I actually really like Hugh Grant. I really like his stuff and even st movies that aren't so great that he's in, which we'll get to one of those in just a moment. I think he's very fun, charming, pleasant all around. And this is a legitimately very good movie with some emotional depth to it that explores ideas. And I kind of wish he would have like followed the pattern of this movie because he, he went so much into the path of rom-coms that were just kind of high concept quirky stuff that his actual potential didn't get realized I think and so that's a that's a pretty big disappointment to me because I'm a, a very big fan of his and I think his he's his very talented fellow and this is one of a great example of that next up Air America which I've never seen and you can tell because it's never been open but you just look at it Mel Gibson one of my favorite actors of all time Robert Downey Jr. Great, very talented actor, both very charismatic, great on screen, in together in a movie. And I've never seen it for some reason, so I need to I need to like just put this one off to the side, maybe even watch it tonight since um, it seems silly that I haven't watched it. Next up, we've got the Alien Anthology. Now, if you spent any time on my channel at all, you know Aliens is one of my absolute favorite movies of all time. That's like a top 10 movie for me. And the movie I hate the most is Alien 3 which I think is just dreadful because it screws up, messes with the mythology of aliens. I just hate what it did with it, so that's the movie I hate the most. And then there's a, a, a fourth one in there too. Um, so this, though, however, is one of the best, absolute best Blu-ray DVD sets that's ever put out there. The documentaries, the special features on this are wonderful, just in-depth exploring the writing, the production of all the movies, where they came from, in-depth, 
I mean, just really great stuff. And so whether that's for a movie I absolutely love or a movie I absolutely hate, hearing how those things came into existence is wonderful. So this one right here, the Alien Anthology, as for not just talking about the movies that I own, but the actual great Blu-ray sets and great Blu-rays and DVDs, this is one of the greats that you want to check out, that you want to make sure that you have if you are a fan of movies. Don't just get a crappy version of Aliens on DVD. There's some cheap versions of that out there. Get the one that has the special features. They are definitely worth it. Speaking of Hugh Grant, American Dreams. It's one that I look at the cast and I go, oh yeah, William Defoe was in that. Oh yeah, Dennis Quaid was in that. It's kind of a take on American Idol, so American Dreams, and then Hugh Grant is playing kind of the Simon Cowell of it. And the movie overall, very forgettable. I mean, some little funny moments, but as a movie, in the, I mean, just... Like I'm trying to remember, like, oh, yeah, those people were in it. What, what's the plot? And I think there's a terrorist plot, now that I think about it. Weird movie, um, not nearly as good as it should be, not nearly as good as its cast, and generally just forgotten by time. Next up, Anastasia. This is one that I don't think I've ever actually seen this one. This is definitely one of my wife's selections, uh, so I can't really comment on it. It creeped me out just the little bits that I saw from it. So, um, my wife was like, Hey, it's so wonderful. We can see that. And then we had kids and she's like, I can show it to the kids. And then you can just look on the back of it. And there's this creepy guy. And I think his eye falls out at parts in it and stuff, or it's Rasputin, I guess it would be. Um, that's weird. So not particularly kid friendly, not particularly Sean friendly. Let's move on. Anchorman. Uh, I've actually never been a huge Anchorman fan. I mean, I enjoy it. I, I give it a positive review. But when it comes to kind of this team up with the Will Ferrell and uh, Adam McKay's of the universe of the different movies they've done, I think Talladega Nights is my favorite or the Step Brothers. But it's one of the other ones. Anchorman, while very funny, just felt a little bit too scatterbrained for me. I mean, just an incredible cast of uh, kind of everyone kind of stealing whatever scenes that they're in. And this one, the Anchorman, as well as the different versions of it, great deep. DVD and Blu-ray sets because there's so many outtakes that, I mean, there's even like in one version of it, there's a separate movie they made from all the outtakes and they cut them together into a subplot. But, um, you know, even the cheapy version that I have has 35 minutes of bloopers and extra scenes and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of very good versions of it. Next up, we have got Armageddon. I said it in my ranking of the Michael Bay movies. This is actually my favorite Michael Bay movie. I'm not a big fan of even the first Transformers movie. That's some where that comes from. But uh, of his movies, this, I mean, I saw it when I was in high school. I thought it was a ton of fun back then. It's dumb, of course. I mean, inherently the plot's stupid. But, I mean, it's just got a great cast of people. Some of them, like, right as they're up and coming. So before they kind of had this big established persona, they're in this movie. It was like the first time seeing some of these people. I've been at like it. I'd seen just small little things and other things. This may be the first one I saw him as the big star guy. Um, so a bunch of different people like that just at the right moment in time. And just a big, dumb blockbuster movie. Michael Bay at his best right there. And um, yeah, this is a terrible Blu-ray version. It has no special features. Even though like there's one that has a commentary track where Ben Affleck trashes the movie. There's one that's the director's cut. And I've, of course, got the crappy one. So shame on me. Next up, Atlantis. I've never seen this. Um, so I have nothing to say about it. Um, it exists. It's from Walt Disney and this has a commentary track on it. There you go. That's all you get since I haven't seen it. Next up, we've got two Avengers movies. So if you've been on my channel, you know, I've talked at ranked the MC movie, MCU movies quite a bit. Uh, I think both these movies are very good, very entertaining. The first one is uh, quite a bit better than the second one, but the second one's still a very good, enjoyable movie. Just it felt a little bit too much like Kevin Feige had a little, few too many mandates for what needed to be in there. So a little bit too cluttered for my taste, but still very enjoyable film. The cast is still great. There's still some very memorable jokes, action sequences, all the things that made the first one great are in there, just not as tightly constructed. But um, as is the case with all the Marvel ones, they've got a bunch of great special features on them. They don't skimp and they don't tend to do that double dipping where they release like the crappy version, then the better version, then the extended cut version. So I appreciate that about Marvel that they've never played those games. Next up, we've got the original Bad Boys and it's unopened. This would be one of those ones that I've had stolen from me in the past, so I own a second copy of it. Um, I didn't see this actually when it originally came out. I don't, I don't even know if I saw the first one until after I saw the second one. I saw the second one in the theater. 
And I really like it. I like Taya Leone. My wife really likes Taya Leone. She's the girl in this one. So, you know, obviously two fun, charismatic lead guys together with Taya Leone makes for a very enjoyable movie. At the same time, kind of forgettable because I always forget what the plot is. I just remember the three of those people having fun being charismatic leading people together. And the plot, pff, who knows? Next up, Balto. I think I watched it one time with my kids. Um, it's a dog movie. Um, that's all I got for you. I remember there was a scene and I was like, well, that's pretty emotional. That kind of works a little bit. But overall, not exactly a great movie. Next up, we've got the original 1989 to 1997 Batman the Motion Picture Anthology. I don't know if there's anywhere else where you call it Batman the Motion Picture, but there you go, the Batman the Motion Picture Anthology. Um, I mean, Batman and Batman Returns kind of define my childhood. And then there's those two weird ones by Joel Schumacher. I convinced myself when Batman Forever came out that it was a good movie. And then Batman and Robin, I was old enough by then. I saw that one. I went, this is just, a, this is a pile of garbage. Like, I can't believe that this exists. Now, some of these have great special features on them, like the one for Batman has a bunch of cool special features. There's even some animatic type stuff where they show a sequence that was cut out that was like a chase scene towards the end of the movie where they go through a circus and like they see the Graysons in there. There's a number of like things that were they did some cool stuff for the special features. But then you get to some of the later ones and it's a little bit more skimpy on what it is. It's not as good of special features, but all like this set right here, it's actually a good Blu-ray set where you get some of the stuff that you want, some honest interviews in there on some of it. Actually, no, let me double check that. I had a previous one. No, this is the one that has good stuff. Like, they'll even trash Batman and Robin. They, like, on the features for the movie, they will trash the movie they're in. The cast and the crew acknowledge the fault of them. So this is the good one. I had a previous one that was a bad set, so I replaced it with the good set. So this one, if you... Purist, this is the one set to pick up that has the good special features for all of the movies, not just the first two. Next up on our Batman quest, it's called the Dark Knight Trilogy, but I trying to go common sense wise when I sort my movies, so these are Batman movies, so they're next to the other Batman movies. The Nolan films, this is like the definitive Blu-ray set for them that has all of the good versions of all of the movies with all the cool special features, all the best stuff you have is in this set right here. Um, so I actually had some of the movies already, but this is in a nice, cool set that even has booklets and nice, pretty, everything, concise. Um, so double dipped on some of that stuff. So actually in my garage, I have extra copies of this movie. So if you know me in real life and want a free copy of this, um, I can probably give you, not this, of some of the other movies in this, I, I can probably get it to you. But anyway, obviously great movies. I like all three of them. Um, and I go back and forth whether between Bat or the Batman Begins or the Dark Knight are my favorite of the bunch, but overall great set with some cool special features. I really like the special features, especially on uh, Batman Begins, where they talk about where they started writing it, and Christopher Nolan and David Goyer being in a coffee shop writing things together, and then talking about Christian Bale's weight loss and weight gain, and the fighting method that they decided with Casey fighting method. It's more defined in the first one, and they were like very intentional in picking a specific fighting style for the film, and then they kind of Drifted off from there and did some funky stuff, but where the like by the Dark Knight Rises, it's just these weird clunky punches and stuff. But there's some cool special features that tie into the first one. Next up, Batman v Superman: Donna Justice Ultimate Edition. Um, I never, I didn't hate Batman v Superman, even in the theatrical version. It's disappointing. Um, there's some obvious problems in it, but it delivers really big on some great stuff. Just some of the hate for it just seems so exaggerated for me. But uh, I, I get some of it at the same time. Um, yeah, this isn't a great Blu-ray feature. I'm, this is one that I think will have better stuff as time passes. And they do a re-release where they can talk a little bit more openly about what happened in the history of it. That's what I'm caring for. But the actual, as for the version I have right now, it didn't have too many things that interested me a great deal. Next up, back to the future, the Blu-ray set 25th edition, anniversary edition. Obviously the movies are great. I did a video ranking all of them, but what's great about these ones is there's some amazing, amazing, amazing set of special features for Back to the Future where they just kind of go through the history of it. The footage talking about how they had cast Eric Stoltz and had to replace him. There's a bunch of deleted scenes for the second one. Just a ton of stuff where they, there's, cause they've done so many, because the movies were such a big hit, they've had great special 
special features throughout the years. And so they'll include some of the different interviews from the 80s, the 90s, and then currently new ones from the people. Retrospectives. Uh, this is a great Blu-ray set. If you're a fan of this, I'm sure you already own this. It's frequently on sale for even a pretty good price at Best Buy. But this is another great set right here. Next up, B-Movie. Stars Jerry Seinfeld. And I've never seen it, and I don't even know why we own it. I don't even know where it came from. My kids have never seen this. We've never thrown this one in, so I own it right there. Sweet. Uh, next up, best of the best, one and two. Uh, I love these movies. Now, granted, they um, <laughs> this is actually one of the strangest uh, film series in history because the first one is like a sports team movie about them going to the national karate competition, though it's actually taekwondo, and like the, it's, it has some rocky vibes, but it's a, very much a sports movie where they're trying to beat the Koreans, uh, so obviously it's not karate. And then the second one is a, and this is PG-13, the second one is a violent rated R revenge movie where bones are being snapped, bones are popping out, there's a character that gets blown away by a shotgun and fingers are flying off. And so then, kind of a weird set of movies, but then it goes on, there's a third and fourth one in the series that are just action movies, basically, like gunfights and stuff like that. So it goes from team sports movie to violent revenge martial arts film to just action movies that went straight to video. Um, but the actual cast on these ones makes what makes some of it kind of interesting because you got Eric Roberts, Julia Roberts, uh, brother and Emma Roberts, dad. Uh, <laughs> then you've got James Earl Jones as the coach of the team. It's, it's kind of like, why are these people in this movie? So it's an amazing piece of history. Next up, we've got Bewitched. I think I watched it for the first time like a year ago. It's a lot more charming than I thought it would be. Just sometimes I get annoyed and decide not to like things for no reason. That's just my personality. I actually watched it. Not too bad. Um, enjoyable enough, forgettable enough. Kind of all those different enough type words. But there it is. I own it. Next up, here's where we start getting to the good stuff. Beverly Hills Chihuahua. <laughs> Three. So, I mean, maybe I was a little bit confused by the plot of this one when I watched it for the first time with my daughter a couple weeks ago because it's the third one. I didn't know where all these characters came from. But apparently there's three of these. When you've got a three-year-old daughter, any movie with dogs in it like this, it's an easy win. She, she loved that movie, and um, it's, it's as awful as you think it would be. Uh, next up, we've got Big, of course, a classic Tom Hanks film. Oh, tons of fun. Kind of one of those at that point in time where he was just establishing himself as kind of the legend that is Tom Hanks. He had a splash before this. He'd done the TV show Bosom Buddies before this. And then you just have mega hits like Big that just kind of, he's here to stay. He is an A-lister and he's going to be there for a very, very long time. And when you rewatch it, it's just so fun. It's so charming. And there are plenty of very good DVD and Blu-ray editions of it that have cool special features like this one that's an extended edition uh, that has, I mean, like all kinds of two discs. Well, it's DVD, so it's two discs because you can't put very much on a DVD, but a bunch of cool, fun stuff on there. Next one, Big Daddy. So uh, one of these... Adam Sandler movies at that point in time where his career started like explode and he was getting super duper duper popular when I was in high school. So he started out kind of with the Happy Gilmore's Billy Madison's, which are only kind of modest hits. And then um, Wedding Singer came out and kind of like sprung him up to like people liked him on a different level. And then The Water Boy and Big Daddy came out and they made just crazy bukus of money. So this one has all sorts of nostalgia to my childhood. Uh, it's not my favorite of his movies, but it's certainly a fun one um, that I have all sorts of nostalgic memories for. Next up, Big Fish. I've only seen it one time. Um, I enjoyed it enough. I wasn't crazy about it. The thing that's actually most uh, memorable about this is that it's written by a guy named John August, who has a uh, podcast called Script Notes where he talks about screenwriting. And so he's talked about this movie a lot because he adapted it into a Broadway musical while he was on the script, uh, script note show. So he talked about it quite a bit. And so it's one of the ones he references a, a lot. So that's the, the actual main memory I have about this movie is John August, the screenwriter, more so than even the movie itself. Next up. I'll just leave that in there. Next up, we've got Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Bill and Ted's 
Bogus Journey. So some are more of those kind of definitive movies of my childhood that I kind of remember going to go see in the theater. So like this one's with some of my earliest childhood memories of going to the theaters is this one. I think we saw it in the theaters. I could even be making that up. That's how early in life it was for me. But uh, you know, one of those movies I've watched my whole life. And then the second one came out and... Um, a little bit too freaky and weird. Strange direction to go with it. One that I've probably grown to appreciate more as I've gotten older than I did as a child. But the first one, um, just very enjoyable at the time. And then when I've rewatched it, I've been like, this is actually holds up really well and is funnier than I actually remembered it being. Largely because there's so many jokes I didn't get as a child. Whether the history jokes, the sex jokes, all sorts of things about it that when you see it and you're like eight years old, you're like, doo, 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 and then you're like, oh, now I get what the joke is. So um, really enjoy the first one. I probably need to rewatch the second one to see uh, how much it holds up for me. My sister borrowed these recently. I actually showed them, I think both of them to her kids, maybe just the first one. And they're 12 years old now. And so we're starting to have a generational thing with the Bill and Ted movies. Next up, Blade One and Blade Trinity. No need for that Guillermo del Toro crap. No, actually, I actually probably like the movies in order that they released. The first, I'm watching this on the screen, so I'm getting confused as which hand is when what. But the first one is definitely my favorite of the bunch. Um, just establishing the world, the world building of it. Then the second one's probably the most fun of the bunch. And just some of the visuals of it, Guillermo is really cool, but just as the story didn't resonate with me quite as much, and some of the visuals don't hold up, they went a little bit too far with the CGI stuff that they went with it. And Blade Trinity is a movie that I defended for about 10 years, up until about a year ago. I actually defended this movie because there's things in it that I really did, really liked, which I still do, and I liked it when I first watched it, then I rewatched it about a year ago. And the movie is a an absolute mess, the story-wise. And then what happened was I started like, wow, why is this so messed up? And I'd heard some rumors and stories and stuff. And you can look it up. Patton Oswalt's in this. He's given some just open interviews about the process of making it and how Wesley Snipes wouldn't go out of his trailer. Ryan Reynolds has given equally just blunt, trashing the movie interviews. I'm pretty sure David Goyer, the writer and director, has given interviews, trashing and talking about the process. And basically Wesley Snipes just got like full of himself, went full method actor, total weirdo, and was, they wouldn't, he wouldn't work with people. And so basically they had to cobble the movie together with the footage they had. And so there's scenes in it where you just see kind of Wesley Snipes standing there being like, use it, go for it. Just saying like these movie inspirational lines. And it's just him facing one direction, everyone else having a scene over here. And like, you're not sure if, how it ties together and stuff. Um, and it's because he's so screwed with kind of the movie and how they made things. So all in all, a jumbled mess of a movie. Anyway, talking too long on that one, if I'm gonna talk about 287 movies. Next up, Blades of Glory. Uh, this is a movie I only saw one time and I thought it was really funny the one time I watched it and then I never felt the urge to watch it again, which isn't particularly a good sign when you don't want to rewatch a movie. But all in all, not a, you know, a, a fine little movie, enjoyable enough. I just seemed like one of the, at that time, point in time where they're like, what if we had Will Ferrell play basketball? What if we had Will Ferrell as an ice skater? Who will we team him up in this one? Napoleon Dynamite. And so just felt like such a movie of its time. There was, you can see the studio heads. We'll put Napoleon Dynamite in this movie. Just all that kinds of stuff that was really going on at that point in time. Next up, Blindside. I really enjoyed the Blindside. A fun sports movie, fun family movie. It had a humor to it, it had a heart to it. Just a lot of things. And just knowing that it was based off real life kind of made it extra special. So all in all, just a very cool movie. If you buy your movies from Blockbuster, they don't have special features though. So this version doesn't have a lot of options and uh, it's for rent if you want to. Uh, want to. I said want to because I was reading the word rental and then went said want and then it turned into want to. Fun times. Next up, this one actually will go back on the stack because it needs to go somewhere else for time count. Bloodsport is the very first rated R movie I remember seeing. So it's probably the very first one I saw uh, back in the summer of 1989. I, the year before, had moved to Texas. We went back to visit in um, California where I was born and raised. Went over to my friend's house. And when we were seven years old, he's like, my dad's got this cool movie called Bloodsport. And I watched Bloodsport and I've been in love with the movie Bloodsport and Jean-Claude Van Damme ever since then. 
Uh, Bloodsport's a very cool movie. You can get this double pack DVD or Blu-ray pack for like five bucks at any Best Buy. No special features, no cool stuff like that, but you get the movies in high definition, and both of those ones are classic, classic Van Damme. Next up, Boondock Saints. Um, I enjoyed this one enough. Uh, kind of fun, stylized. I didn't love it. There's a little bit, a few things in it that are kind of weird. Uh, just seem kind of random in it, like the William Defoe stuff. But overall, just a fun action movie that kind of delivers on a lot of levels. I never saw the sequel to it. I don't even really know what the reputation of the sequel is, which in and of itself kind of means it's probably not very good. Um, but yeah, there you go. This version of it doesn't have too much anything fancy about it. Next up. Bottle Rocket, Wes Anderson's very first movie. For a long time, this was my favorite Wes Anderson movie. It's probably Royal Tenenbaums now, but um, just because of my um, contrarianism, I decided to go with this one for a little bit. But you've got a young Luke Wilson, and Owen Wilson, and James Conn. You also have the other Wilson brother. I think Andrew Wilson is in it as well. But um, just a small-time, little, weird, quirky Wes Anderson movie before Wes Anderson went over the top into his Wes Andersonisms. This is like, you can see a little bit in there. You can see certainly see his humor in it, but just like crazy <laughs> that became Wes Anderson and crazy brilliant. Um, but certainly very distinctly into a weird niche way of making movies. Um, this is before all of that. So if you kind of want to see a slightly more, I don't even want to say mainstream, but less quirky a Wes Anderson movie, check out Bottle Rocket. I, I really enjoyed Bottle Rocket. Next up, we've got two of the Bourne movies, The Bourne Identity and The Bold Ultimatum. Once again, uh, to Born Supremacy. No, uh, I owed it. Once again, a lot of my movies are missing. But uh, this is a great trilogy of movies. The first one's actually my favorite. I love what Doug Lyman's style to it. I love the relationship with the, the, the girl and all of those kind of elements to it. I thought this one just was a little bit tighter, whereas the second and third ones just kind of blended together to a little bit to me. Not necessarily even a bad way, but if I'm trying to pick a distinct favorite of the bunch, I would go with this one. All of them just have some pretty nice special features talking about the fighting style, kind of giving some reasoning for the cut foo stuff that they do and the shaky cam uh, in the later ones. But very solid movies. They've got, got plenty of good DVD and Blu-ray releases for them. I only have the DVDs because I bought them a long time ago. And as you'll notice as a pattern, as I'm sure you've noticed, I buy a lot of them at Blockbuster. And not normally when they're that much previously used when they were cheaper than that. That's how I got most of my movies. Next up, one of my favorites of all time, Braveheart. Great, great movie. Um, it's like three hours long. It feels like it's three hours long, but it's a good, hearty, not fun. I was about to say fun three hours. It is not particularly fun most of the time, but it's very powerful, very solid um, all around. Just a well-crafted script, great performances, amazing battle sequences that all around um, huge... Uh, well, it came out when I was in middle school, so also kind of one of the definitive like rated R movies where my mom was first like, you can go see this rated R movie where people get cut to pieces. Thanks, mom. That's a great idea. And uh, so I've loved it ever since. Um, I love my violent movies. Next up, Bruce Almighty. This is the first movie where I saw Steve Carell in it. And so I, I'd never seen him on The Daily Show I don't remember where this one came in reference to Anchorman, but him as this newsman that talks real crazy fast, going blah, 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 doing that stuff. That's where I was like, whoever, this guy's really funny. And then there was like five year gap until I saw him on The Office. Actually, it was like only like three or four years. Time, you perceive fine, time funny when you're young. But um, then he became, you know, one of my favorite actors that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy. But all in all, this is uh, almost kind of like, in my mind, maybe the last great Jim Carrey movie. And it's like, 15 years old now, which is crazy to think about. And he's done some comedy since then, but of the last great um, Jim Carrey comedies, this is probably this one. Next up, we've got Casino Royale. I think I've said it many times before, but this is my favorite of the James Bond movies. So naturally, it's my favorite of the Daniel Craig James Bond movies. But um, yeah, I, I, I just think on so many levels, it works as a love story, as an action movie, as a card playing movie. I think Le Chief, er, Chef Le Chief is the best of the Bond villains. It's just so memorable while not being physically intimidating, not being traditionally scary, which is Matt Mickelson's performance in the creepiness to him and all the little details just just make for a very solid movie um i bought this one used at a bookstore so it's not a very good version of the blu-ray next up catch and release with jennifer garner um yeah it's um forgettable i don't really remember too much of anything about it except oh yeah that 
dramedy with Jennifer Garner and Kevin Smith as an actor. Oh, yeah, and Timothy Oliphant's in it. I forgot that, too, and my finger was over his face. That tells you how memorable this movie is. I think my wife likes it a good bit, but I don't. I don't pay much of attention to its existence at all. Next up, Catch Me If You Can. I, I love this movie. Uh, and I, one of the things I love about it is that it's a Steven Spielberg movie that's so different. Uh, it's not the overt Oscar bait of you know his war movies. And it's not the adventure movie. It's not the sci-fi movie. But it's a period piece, on-the-run comedy just filled with amazing performances from from everyone. They're all fun. They're all charismatic. This is the first movie where we noticed Amy Adams, and she has a pretty small part in it. And even the small part she had in it, she popped to me. Like I saw, I was like, I don't know who that is, but she seems very likable and charming. Next up, the Chipmunk movie. I'd never seen this before, and then it appeared at our house some way. It is Alvin's Diamond Edition, and it has like a music video as the special feature. That's the oh, Alvin's Diamond Edition. That's incredible. Movie itself, not incredible, but my three-year-old daughter enjoys it. So if you have the taste of a three-year-old, this might be the movie for you. Next up, Clue. I love this movie. I grew up watching this movie. It used to come on TV on like Saturday afternoons all the time. And it's like a murder mystery comedy based off the board game, obviously. And so it just kind of plays it up, kind of slapsticky wordplay type stuff with just kind of a great cast of fun characters all throughout. Christopher Lloyd, Tim Curry. Um, so this is one I, I love this one. It's in, it, it has three different endings to it. And I guess when I showed it in theaters, it, depending on which one you went to, it had a different ending. So it's just ton of, tons of fun stuff like that. Next up, The Chronicles of Riddick. I've only seen this one time. I've seen Pitch Black a bunch of times, but this one I've actually only seen one time. And I guess whenever I first bought this in Actually, no, since this is unopened, I guess it's not true. So I don't even know why I rebought it since it's a movie I didn't care enough to rewatch ever. But yeah, I own it. Next up, Cars. I don't even know why I bought Cars. That's like torturing myself. But um, yeah, I mean, it's like all the Pixar movies has a great set of special features on it for whoever cares about the making of Cars. But uh, I don't know, just kind of bland Pixar for me. Um, I my kids love it. So I guess that's the target audience. So I shouldn't pick on it too much that a movie not designed for me doesn't appeal to me. And it appeals absolutely to its target audience. So I've seen this one out of order many, many times coming home and my kids are watching it. Uh, and our disc is scratched. So it also skips around when you watch it. So that makes for an interesting viewing experience. Next up, we got a couple of Captain America movies. Um, I actually really enjoyed the first one. The first hour of it, kind of the origin story of Captain America is one of my favorite hours of the MCU. Just love that kind of origin story, true hero type stuff that a guy that just wants to serve and do what he can. That stuff's very powerful to me. Um, and then the second one, uh, of course, is just a very solid, powerful movie, or well-made, well-crafted movie that takes the comic book genre in a new direction that I think makes for just a very cool movie experience. So, Great two movies, and then there's a third one that's also great, even though the third one cheats a little bit because it's kind of Avengers 2.5. Next up, final in this stack of movies, Cliffhanger. I'm a huge Stallone fan, as if you're on my channel for any amount of time, you are aware of that. This seems a little bit kind of like one of his forgotten movies. It's a really good action thriller that has an interesting setting for it because it's out the mic up in the mountains. Michael Rooker, Yondu from Guardians of the Galaxy, is kind of the He's not like a he's not a really a friend of Stallone's in this movie, but a guy that's kind of on his side and stuff. So you get a lot of great back and forth between the two of them. That's a ton of fun. John Lithgow's this crazy over the top villain. Um, so I, I really like this movie. This is one of those movies that if you haven't seen it and you're a fan of action movies, you, you got to check this one out. It's actually really good. Um, Lithgow's performance might be a little bit campy because it's so kind of over the top in some of the parts of it. But besides that, just kind of pretty solid rated R action movie from the early 90s that I, I thoroughly enjoy. Apparently, it's got a bunch of special features, too. I should probably check some of those out. All right, we're moving on to my second stack. It took me almost 40 minutes to get through the first stack, and there's eight stacks, so I think I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit on this one. Next up, we've got Cinderella Man. This is actually a movie that my wife told me about. I hadn't seen it before we got married. She owned it. It got stolen, so we had to buy a new copy. Clearly, we don't watch it very often. Very good, solid um, boxing drama um, that I've only watched, I think, one time because my wife loves it. 
Next up, Clear and Present Danger. This is my favorite of the Jack Ryan movies. I saw it in the theaters, loved it back then, and I've loved it every time I've rewatched. Just a cool political action thriller with a uh, lead man that's not really the action man, but he's willing to step into it. And then you got William Defoe as the action man. Um, very cool movie. I really like this one. If you haven't seen this one, you got to check out Clear and Present Danger. Next up, Click. I actually think this is the last Adam Sandler movie that I've seen. Um, I like this one, and then he just started getting cuckoo after this. I actually, I think he did, did he last do Last of the Zohan after this one. Maybe I've seen one more in that one. I'm done with Adam Sandler. But, um, yeah, fun enough. A little bit too sentimental, but um, all in all, an enjoyable enough movie. Next up... Commando! I love this movie. Uh, I saw it for the first time, I believe, in the fifth grade at a sleepover at a friend's house. He's like, this movie's stupid! Oh, I love it. Let's rewatch it. It's, let's keep watching it all night long. Um, but just that's one of the best, just dumb, fun movies that knows how dumb it is and it embraces the dumb to its fullest. And who better to do that? Who can have more fun with stupid, cheesy one-liners, picking guys up one, with one arm, than Arnold Schwarzenegger and just... It's, so, it's like a perfect version of the movie that it's trying to be, even in its cheesiness, the wackiness, the bad costumes, all sorts, all of it. Uh, such a wonderful, wonderful little movie. Similarly, Con Air, another movie I love. I saw this one in the theater. I think this is actually my favorite of the Nick Cage action, action renaissance where he did The Rock, Con Air, and Face Off all in this very short period of time right after winning an Oscar. That's what he followed an Oscar up with. I think this might be my favorite of the bunch. I did a review of it on my channel to get my full thoughts on it, but there's different versions of the DVD and Blu-ray of it. Um, be sure to get one of the good ones. This is even the extended edition. You'd think it would be one of the good ones. It's not. It's just got a couple extra scenes in it, but it doesn't have a lot of cool special features. Next up, the Conan, the complete quest, both of the Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, Conan movies. Why is he holding the sword right there? I don't know if that's a normal thing that you're supposed to do, but that's what he's doing in the picture. But um, the first one's pretty great. I mean, it's very hard or gritty, all, all sorts of rated or content in it, um, but, but barbaric in its nature. And then the second one was rated PG as before the PG-13 rating. So it would be PG-13 by today's standards, but like a very watered down and not nearly as good in the second one. But the first one's pretty cool. And you can kind of understand where Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of became this icon out of it just because it's just so bombastic and crazy. Um, but you, you got to see, um, you got to see the, the first one, at least at some point in time in your life. Next up, Crazy Stupid Love. I've actually only seen this one time, and I've been meaning to rewatch it basically since I watched it the first time. I, it, from my memory, I really loved it. And it's based entirely around, you just go through the cast of this movie, and they're all people that I just, I think are incredibly charming and fun to see on screen, except Julianne Moore. And I don't have a problem with Julianne Moore. She's just not in the same category as all the other leads in it that I think are very, very charming. Um, and so you put all them together in a movie where it's kind of romantic stories for all of them, and you naturally have a very fun, charming movie that I need to rewatch more um, and check out so I can look at those abs right there. Next up, not one, but two copies of Ben Affleck's Daredevil, and I'm pretty sure I had two more copies of it that got stolen back in that robbery I told you about earlier in this video. Anyway, I, I never... I've never really fully understood the hate for this movie. I get some of the criticism. I understand why people don't think it's a good movie, but the actual absolutely trashing it always seemed a little bit exaggerated. And I think some of it's a little bit of revisionist history in that the comic book genre has developed a lot since these movies came out and the, the figure out the tone and how to handle some of this stuff. This movie, they were figuring it out and some of that they did well and some of that they did pretty poorly. Having a guy with a bullseye on his head is stupid. Having two people fight on a playground and flipping all around is pretty stupid. But there's things in it that aren't aren't so bad. I've I've never had any big issues with Ben Affleck. I very much as I mentioned earlier like Jennifer Garner. So her and her it kind of when she was in good shape from Alias and all that, it is a comic book character that beats people up. I'm on board with that. And the uh Extended edition is actually quite a bit better than the original. There's both like 20 minute subplots of Matt Murdock as a detective in it, but also they change some details in it. But like between them where they sleep together, where in the director's cut, he hears a crime and doesn't pursue her. He chooses to be the crime fighter, not the lover. And so there's actual significant differences to it. So if you're going to check this one out, definitely get the DV, or director's cut of it. It's much better than the theatrical cut, but I think both are a little bit underrated. 
Next up, Dawn of the Dead. I, I always really liked this movie. Just a, a very solid update on the zombie genre. And obviously it's a remake of the original. And it's true to much of the original while having a modern flavor to it and changing things where applicable. And so I, I really like both versions of Dawn of the Dead. I used to own the original. It's one of the ones that did get stolen. But uh, this one, a very solid version of it. And it's kind of fun because it's one of those movies that ha it, like uh, Ty Burrell from Modern Family and all, all kinds of stuff. He's in this five years before became kind of a household name that people know who he is. So it's kind of fun to see him in a different type of role in a zombie movie. But I, I've always I've never I, I've always been on the Zack Snyder train. I don't necessarily like all of his movies and I haven't seen Sucker Punch, some of the ones that people hate. But, you know, his style and stuff, I don't hold any of that against him. I just think that sometimes he's done. I don't know that like a complex comic book movie with intricate plot stuff is the best use of his skills. With simplified stuff, I think he, he's great at it. Fits in perfectly. Next up, the Die Hard collection. This is actually the complete Die Hard collection with Die Hard 1 through 4, not that um, fifth one that doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, unfortunately, it does exist. But uh, I like all four of these movies. Uh, even Live for Your Die Hard. I don't actually have any significant issues with it. It feels weird as a Die Hard movie, but it's just as an action movie. I think it's fun enough, enjoyable enough. I don't have any major criticisms of it. A little bit too over the top considered, compared to maybe the original. But all in all, Die Hard might be my favorite action movie of all time. Certainly, I'd give it a 10 out of 10. And then Die Hard with a Vengeance is one of the great action sequels of all time and a great action movie in and of itself. So this is a great set that gets played in my home all of the time. Now the problem with this set though is that it doesn't have the special features for the movies and there's some versions of Die Hard that have a huge great set of special features. So this is choosing to have all the movies in one container but if you want the special features, the good stuff, you got to get the like I think it's like the 25th, an 25th anniversary edition of Die Hard. Next up, Dirty Dancing. Clearly, we watch it all the time. Um, I think I've only seen Dirty Dancing one time. And so maybe I need to rewatch it since it's kind of a classic and ties back into a Crazy Stupid Love. So maybe I have a double feature of Dirty Dancing and Crazy Stupid Love. But um, yeah, apparently there's a lot of special features on this movie that I haven't opened or watched. I think it's been on streaming is kind of why my wife watches it from time to time. But not me. Next up, Dumbo. I haven't watched it in 25 years, so I don't really have thoughts on it. Um, but it's Dumbo, and it's a classic, and I remember it being pretty dark at times. But And it's getting remade. That's cool. I don't have thoughts on it. Edge of Darkness. Um, this is one that... Wow, it's sealed, sealed as well. Nice and wrapped there. Uh, Edge of Darkness is a kind of forgotten... Um, movie from Mel Gibson as well as Martin Campbell. So it's Martin Campbell who did GoldenEye, Casino Royale. He did The Mask of Zorro. So he's done some really good stuff. He also did Green Lantern after this one. So he's kind of like in director prison right now. But so right after, not right after, but a little bit after Casino Royale, this is the movie that he did. But at the time it came out, Mel Gibson was kind of at the peak of Mel Gibson hate. And so the movie kind of got overlooked and it's a really dark, violent movie. Not like, not really an action movie. It's a thriller, mystery, revenge story, but not really an action movie at all. But very cool drama. If you, if you like Mel Gibson, if you like dark kind of crime stuff, you want to check this one out. And it's also interesting because actually Martin Campbell originally did this 20 years before this in on the BBC, I believe is where he did it. Uh, and it was like a mini series, I think, and then remade his own movie as this really dark movie. It didn't do very well because of the context of when it came out. And it's, it's kind of hard to find its audience with a movie that dark, but it's very cool. Next up is Live, Die, Repeat, Edge of Tomorrow, All You Need Is Kill. Pick your title. I don't know which one you go with. Any way you put it, this is a, this is a cool movie. Uh, one of the worst marketed movies of all time, or certainly of recent history, where they got the tone of the movie wrong, and so people didn't go to see it. I didn't go see it in the theater. My wife didn't go see it in the theater. And then I heard great things about it, and so we checked it out as soon as you could rent it, and we loved it. And I, my, my, even though the movie repeats itself, and so my wife's already seen it a thousand times seeing it one time, she watches the movie all the time, puts it on to go to bed, and just uh, loves it. It's a huge, fun sci-fi movie. I love Doug Liman. He's like one of these guys that I feel like it's underappreciated, because if you think through the sort of stuff that he's done, he's done a, so many fun movies and some of them are kind of important movies too so all in all if you haven't seen this one you have to see this movie it is it's a great one i don't know what they're gonna do with the sequel seems like a weird choice 
Next up, we've got another movie in, like, apparently I've got quite a few Jennifer Garner movies. Not a terribly big surprise. I, I don't, I've never actually watched this one at home. It was only $2, $3 used, and so I bought it. I saw it once in the theater. I barely remember anything about it, so I probably do need to re-watch it um, just to see how well I remember it. And it's certainly very watchable because Jennifer Garner's in it, though the plot is probably horrible. Um, but it's directed by, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? He did, did, did a ton, a ton of X-Files stuff. I'm just like, Rob Bowman did a ton of X-Files stuff. Um, he directed the Dragon movie with Christian Bale and Matthew McConaughey. We'll get to that one actually very shortly. But, um, so yeah, I, I wanted to like it, but then the movie itself is not very good. And there's just one very key watchable thing in it. Next up, one that I didn't buy enough. Another one my wife puts on very frequently. I find the movie actually incredibly offensive because the bad guy in it is the Rocketeer. How do you make the Rocketeer the bad guy in a movie where he's a wife beater and this abusive control person? That is offensive to me, so I hate this movie. It's a pretty enjoyable little thriller revenge movie. Not really revenge, but payback type movie. But because of what it did to the Rocketeer, I'm offended by it, and so... It's disgusting to me. Next up, Entrapment. Um, I don't particularly care for this movie all that much. I've never really liked it. Uh, I didn't see it in the theaters. And I think my wife was like, oh, you got to see Entrapment, which I thought was strange since the most famous scene in the movie is Catherine Zeta-Jones going underneath wires as it zooms in on her buttocks. Uh, gr fine scene in the movie, but <laughs> weird that my wife's like, what? You haven't seen this one. You got to check this one out, um, which has two meanings to it. Um, but I, I don't particularly care for it. Um, it just never really interested me all that much. Next up, Equilibrium. Another one that, that's like three in a row that my wife, they're all e-movies that my wife is really into that I'm not as much into. I never particularly cared for this one, but the key thing about this movie is it's like a sci-fi action movie starring Christian Bale, and it came out shortly before he was cast as Batman. And basically the thing was, I saw this one and I went, hey, look, um, this Christian Bale guy, he'll probably be a good... Batman, because he can pull off the action and seems to be a decent enough actor. That's the key thing about this one that was my takeaway from it. Beyond that, it just felt like a few too many other sci-fi stories that I'd seen before, and so it's a little bit just kind of forgettable. The, the action style in it is, is kind of cool, but a little bit too stylized that you just notice the style over necessarily the substance of the style. So that was disappointing. Next up, Eraser. I, I think I would call this the last of the great Schwarzenegger action movies. Maybe not, this one's probably not great. It's just very good. It's it's a little bit forgettable in that it's a just fairly by the numbers action movie. But if you like action movies, it's a very good action movie. Very well directed. Schwarzenegger at his, like right at the end of his prime. After this one, there's a pretty big dip in quality that he's, he's never really come back from as kind of the leading action man. Um, but uh, just all in all, a movie that I really like, uh, James Conn's the villain in it. And so there's some great back and forth between the two of them. I, that's actually mildly a spoiler, but only mildly a spoiler. But just a, a glossy, slick action movie that I highly recommend that you check out. Next up, Aragon, um, also known as Star Wars with Dragons. My wife read the books and liked them well enough. And right around when we first got married, we actually went on a cruise and they were looping Aragon as like one of the movies that was like, hey, look, this new movie you can watch on the cruise. And so we saw it on there. We didn't like it. So we bought it. I don't know. It's not a very good movie. It clearly sets up a sequel that never came to be because people didn't like that movie very much. Next up, Escape from New York. I've actually never liked this movie as much as I always thought I was supposed to. Even I tried to or started rewatching it about a month ago and didn't like it as much as it was like the same memories. I was like, yeah, this just isn't as good. I like other John Carpenter movies more. I like other Kurt Russell movies more. I like other action movies more. And uh, I haven't even opened this version of it. No good special features, which is disappointing for a movie that even if I don't like it all that much, it's still iconic. Next up, The Expendables 1 and 2. Uh, this series is a little bit frustrating because I think they're very solid action movies. Um, just if you view them just as action movies, they're enjoyable enough because obviously they have amazing cast, but they're never more than just the basic premise of what they are. They never transcend that. The idea that we'll get all these characters together or actors together and do a movie, it's just that. It's a blunt version of that. The first one's a little bit more serious take. The second one's a little bit more tongue in cheek. And the third one's like a weird blend of it, plus a new gang of people, but more the old timers. So you don't get to see as much of them as you want to. 
But I enjoy all of them uh, for what they are, um, and I wish I could enjoy them more. I actually saw this one, the second one with Van Damme, at a special advanced screening of it. We're at the Alamo Draft House, and where it was called Van Damage, and I got like dog tags out of it. They paid four Van Damme movies in a row. It was Bloodsport, Lionheart. Uh, then uh, uh, Universal Soldier and then Expendables and they had like an in- interview with Van Dam specifically for this showing of it so very cool type stuff I got dog tags out of it fond memories and I actually saw the third one at advanced screening too and one of the new guys in it um, Gled Pakium or something like that that's probably the wrong name for him but he was actually in attendance at the showing that I was at which is pretty cool because he's a Austin boy um, so he was in Austin so they got him to do it Okay, next up, we will go with Ever After. Um, I don't have anything to say about it. It's, yeah, what is it? Cinderella, um, not even a modern take on it, just a new telling of it from, tw- with a new take from 20 years ago uh, with Drew Barrymore and the guy that wasn't Wolverine. It exists. It's not bad. I don't, it's not memorable, but it's not bad either. Then we got uh, Fahrenheit 9-11. Um, yeah, Michael Moore can be entertaining. Crazy ideas, weird ideas. He's got a bit of an agenda that kind of taints everything that he does and the way he interprets facts, but he's entertaining. I actually saw him live at UT back right around when this came out, actually. Right before this came out, I saw him at uh, back at kind of his peak of when he, people were in love with him after bowling for Columbine and then everything with George W. Bush. He kind of had his heyday, and that's when I saw him speak at... Uh, UT 15 years ago. Next up, Failure to Launch. Uh, I really enjoy Matthew McConaughey as one of these, um, well, comedic, I don't know, my next McConaughey in almost anything, but I thought he was even really good in his rom com days. Sarah Jessica Parker, not so much. But what makes this one interesting is the side cast of characters where one of his best friends is this guy right here, Bradley Cooper, and then Sarah Jessica Parker's best friend is Zoe Deschanel. And so the movie is kind of jam-packed with these side actors that are kind of, in some ways, either equal to their... Uh, the, the lead equivalent of their batch of people. So it's got a great cast of people, weird movie, a little bit wacky sense of humor to it that I don't think works all that great, but it's a, it's a, I don't know, decent enough movie. Next up, I'll just grab a big batch of these all at once. Um, I'm missing a bunch of these, but Fast and the Furious supposed to be one through six is what's supposed to be right here in my hands. Uh, it's only four of them at the moment. I, I, so I never, I wasn't a big fan of the one through four. They're just enjoyable enough movies, but not anything I love. My like, wife likes cars more than I do, so then we owned all of them. And then the fifth one came out. I became a huge fan of the series. And so there you go. There you have it. Um, the special features on some of them are actually pretty interesting because they talk about the car stunts and when they started incorporating CGI into it, what they're able to do with like going from a practical car stunt to then the CGI camera sweeping around thing from car to car and some so there's some interesting stuff on the DVDs for them. But all in all, they're they're faster than the Furious movies. There you go. I've got a lot of them. Next up, The Faculty. This was actually shot here in Austin, so one of my lifelong friends is in it. Like, there's a close-up of his face in it, which is, is pretty cool when watching the movie. All in all, it's um, another Kevin Williams scripted horror, meta-humor horror movie from the late 90s. I like that kind of movie, so I like this movie quite a bit. And it kind of has, like... You look at the cast of it, it's like a definitive list of like people that were in that type of movie at that time, all in this one movie. So I also have lots of nostalgia for this one, both because my friends roll in because I saw it, I think in the theater when it came out and just because of the cast of it. This is the sort of movie that was my high school years. Next up, The Fantastic Mr. Fox. Our next movie in the Wes Anderson collection. I've never seen this one. My wife bought it from some people like a month ago. She bought like 10 movies for 10 bucks. So I know Fantastic Mr. Fox, which we haven't watched yet. So there we go. I'll move on. Next up, The Family Man from director Brett Ratner, randomly, because that guy directs pretty much every genre of movie. They're real, real style to him. But, um, yeah, it's kind of a what-your-life-could-have-been type movie with Nicolas Cage and Taya Leone. I like Nicolas Cage. I like Taya Leone. The movie is uh, watchable enough. My wife really likes it, though, so that's why we own it. For me, I don't... Like, I, did, she, I guess she watched it way back in the day and so really liked it, and for me, it was like... Okay, it's... 
I guess we can watch this. Next up, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's, of course, an 80s classic. So fun, capturing kind of a certain view of high school and a sense of fun and adventure. But it, overall, it's just a funny movie, just full packed with energy, and then has that John Hughes heart to it that kind of ties it all together a little bit where there's meaning with family stuff, all sorts of things kind of going on it that just makes for a movie that people have loved for a long time for good reason. Next up, Fever Pitch. I guess we're hitting that stride where we run into a bunch of Drew Barrymore movies. Uh, my wife really likes this one. I never really particularly cared for it all that much. Um, just felt a little bit generic and the concept of it didn't necessarily resonate with me. Maybe I need to rewatch it um, and I cared for it a little bit more. I don't know why. Whatever reason, whenever I first watched it, I didn't like it nearly as much as she did. And I'm perfectly fine with rom-coms, especially ones that have Drew Barrymore in them. Next up, Field of Dreams. Uh, uh, one of these classics of my lifetime. I'm kind of at that right age to where it was one of the first kind of serious drama movies that I watched. And I grew up playing baseball. And so it just, you know, has, has one of those special places in my heart because of all of that. But just a, a kind of, in many ways, a very weird movie that's for some reason works and touches on the sense of nostalgia and all, all sorts of nostalgia in different types of ways and longing for family and these kind of deep rooted emotions that just makes it work while having this weird thing about if you build it, they will come thing going on throughout. Next up, Final Destination. There's like a bazillion of these. I think I've only seen the first one. And some of these, one of these days I need to watch the whole series again. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's enjoyable enough. It's never, it was never really my thing. Everyone else seemed to like it a lot more than I did. Um, for whatever reason, this is just one of those ones that wasn't, didn't resonate with me as well as everyone else that's my age. Next up, Finding Nemo. I hadn't seen this movie until I had a son, so I think I first watched it about four years ago, and I thought it, I thought it was great. Like it just it worked for me as a guy in his thirties when I first watched it, and um, obviously it's a classic. But uh, just holding this in my hand, it's a five disc <laughs> Blu-ray set, and then I'm just holding it. I picked it up and I was like, wow, that is heavy. Uh, there's so much stuff in here, so many special features behind the scenes, where it came from. I mean, this is a great little set right here. If you like actual great Blu-rays, this is a great Blu-ray right here that actually has features that you care about that are interesting, um, that stimulate the brain. Next up, Fireproof, the Christian movie about marriage that was a big hit or something like that. If you not big hit based off faith based movies from a few years back. I never saw it. I've never didn't see it in the theater. I didn't watch this version of it. Which you can see it's still wrapped. I think whoever gave someone gave it to me. My mom's like, hey, this would be great for your marriage or something like that. Um, I, I'm just not. As you guys know, if you're on my channel, I used to be a pastor. I'm very churchy, very Christian. Um, but faith based movies, however, in Christian radio. Not my thing. Turbo! I've never seen it. Um, I haven't even seen my kids watch it, so let's move on. I have no thoughts on it. I own it. That's cool. The Firm! Another one of those R-rated movies. It was one of the first ones I saw in the theater. And there's this weird window of time right around this one until about five years after it where they just cranked out all these John Grisham novels into movies and they were all kind of hits. And whenever my family would do car trips, we'd normally like listen to John Grisham books, uh, audiobooks in the car. So I've got all sorts of nostalgic fond memories for these. This one's really good. It's one of the better ones of those John Grisham film adaptations. Just nicely constructed, great cast, and just a, a interesting story to it with lots of layers to it that I've rewatched it many times. And within the last year, I've watched it and it's great. Next up, we've got Forrest Gump. One of those movies that everyone loved it. At the I just thought everyone was in love with this movie for years and years and years. And then as time passed, I realized that there was actually a bunch of people that hate this movie or that kick back on it and don't like it. But I'm certainly in the category that just thinks it's amazing and love it and, you know, has made me love Robert Zemeckis for well, most of my life. And there's another one that has some great special features and very cool stuff. And it's a movie that lends itself nicely to some behind the scenes. Like, how'd they do the special effects? How did they blend this real footage into this? How did they... Um, so it gets pretty interesting at times. Next up, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Uh, I've seen it a couple times. I don't even know. I guess it was cheap whenever we got it from Blockbuster. I was like, I'm in the mood for a rated R comedy. Um, I don't... It's just, it's, it's just kind of one of those movies that kind of exists to me that's amusing enough when I watch it that um, I, I think to myself, hey, I think I'm really going to like this. And every time I watch it, I go, 
okay, that, that happened. Um, don't like it nearly as much as I want to, but I own it. However, on a different category, Four Christmas is a movie that tons of people trash with this Reese Witherspoon in it that I, I really enjoy. I don't, I don't really understand the backlash that people hate this movie. Um, it, it just has a great cast and it gives them settings to be funny. And so it's just enjoyable. They go from place to place to place. So it moves quickly. So my wife and I have thoroughly enjoyed it every Christmas. And so uh, I, I didn't fully understand when I hear people talking about how terrible it is. And like, I, I, just, I, I don't know what they were expecting or what why they have that feeling towards it, but I enjoy it enough. Next up, Frequency. This is one my wife really likes as well um, that I didn't watch when it first came out, and so she owned it. Now we own it. And uh, it's a movie that every time I watch it, I go, eh, this is pretty good. This is a kind of a cool movie about a son talking to his dad in the past and working on time travel type elements, a bunch of cool stuff that's kind of interesting. Made it into a TV show last year, but I also at the same time, I never think to myself, I really want to watch Frequency. But there it is, and now there's a... TV show out of it. I think it only got one season, but um, it exists. Next up, Friday Night Lights. Now, this is a weird one for me because Friday Night Lights, the TV show, is kind of just legendary amongst... Uh, I worked with high schoolers for 10 years, and during that 10 years, Friday Night Lights, the TV show, came out. It takes place in Texas, small town football. I'm in Texas in a town that's centered large around football. So people love Friday Night Lights. This is the movie, and they never talk about the movie, which is interesting because the movie's from the same director, Peter Berg, the guy that did the movie, also did the TV show. There's even some of the cast that uh, transfers between the two of them. But they never talk about the movie. They obsess about the TV show all of the time. Um, so I've actually watched this one time. This is an unowned copy. I need to rewatch it and see if, um, you know, my feelings on it change. Next up, one of the great thrillers of all time and one of the most forgettable thrillers of all time. The Fugitive is, ap I just love The Fugitive. One of my favorite movies of all time. One of the, probably the best definitive performance from Tommy Lee Jones. But then you get the second one that's just... It's too much of a rehash, and it, the what made Tommy Lee Jones' character great is that he was kind of the antagonist that wasn't the antagonist, so switching him to the protagonist of the movie, I just don't know that it worked all that well. But it, it's an interesting movie because Robert Downey Jr. is in it, has a major role in it, and all sorts of important stuff in it, so it's it's interesting to see this young uh, Robert Downey Jr. in it. So it's... it's it's a movie that maybe if it wasn't connected to The Fugitive, you'd view it, history would view it differently, but because The Fugitive is so good, U.S. Marshals just seems like this very strange spin-off sequel to The Fugitive that's out there that I imagine a lot of people don't even realize that's what it is. Next up, Full Contact from Chow Yun-Fat. Um, yeah, this is a one of Chow Yun-Fat's Hong Kong movies before he transitioned over, and he, some of them, A Better Tomorrow, The Killer, Hard Boiled, I absolutely love, and so I thought I'd love this one, but it's not a John Woo movie, this is, a, I believe, Ringo Lam, really, uh, Ringo Lam did this one, and so it, it's the same ballpark of type of movie, but just doesn't have that John Woo vibe to it, so I, I never liked this one quite as much, but it's, it, looking at my collection, I think it's the only one I actually own on DVD or Blu-ray right now, which is kind of funny, the one that I don't like is the one that I own, but I think the others were stolen, so thank you, me, for bringing up a painful memory. Next up, Fun with Dick and Jane, the one from the 70s that I've never seen, it's still wrapped, my wife loves the remake of it. I don't know why we don't own that one. Um, it's, it's not in the stack. But um, loves that one because it has Taya Leone. I guess it has Jim Carrey. So maybe that's the last great uh, comedy. A lot of people don't like that one. We really liked it. But so we bought this one because it was cheap. And then we've never watched it. Fun times. Next up, Galaxy Quest. I'm a huge Star Trek fan, but you don't have to be a huge Star Trek fan to like this one. This is actually just a really good, funny movie that's really a love letter to Star Trek while sending up some of the fandom, while being in love with the fandom. It, all in all, a great cast, very funny. It works on as just kind of a fun sci-fi type adventure. It works as a comedy. And, you know, when you've got just even those are your three leads and you got Tim Allen, Sigourney Weaver and Alan Rickman. And that's where your, your starting point is. But then you go from there and everyone else is also really good. And it's the type of movie you watch and you're like, wait, they're in this, they're in this, they're in this. Um, so all in all, very fun, cool movie. Next up, Get Smart. I grew up watching Get Smart, the TV show on Nick at Night. 
And so I, I was a fan of the material. Then I hadn't watched it for, I don't know, 10, 15 years when this movie came out. We went to go see it kind of on a whim, like, hey, that looks like that might be amusing. And we loved it. And this is actually where I fell in love with uh, Steve Carell. We hadn't watched The Office up to this point in time. This one came out, saw it, and then we started binge watching The Office. And then that's like all we did for the next two years of our life. Whenever we had free time, my wife and I just watched The Office. After watching this movie, the movie itself is good. It's not great. It's not mind blowing. I was surprised they didn't do a sequel to it because it seemed like it did good enough to, to get a sequel. But there you go. Uh, get smart. Um, solid movie. It caused me to love uh, a character or actor. Next up, Ghost Rider. Um, I, I forget this movie exists very frequently. I forget both of them exist all of the time because they're they're not good. And they're weird and not good. <laughs> it's just uh, it was very awkward when it came out of Sun. It was like the flaming head effects are horrible in this. And I, I don't even have much to say about it. I think I got this for free from someone about I don't know, six months ago or something like that. I've, I've only I saw it one time in the theater. I never saw the second one. So I don't have much to say about it, but I own it. Last up in this stack will be Happy Gilmore. We actually bought this like two, three weeks ago and rewatched it. Um, my wife and her family are in love with this. They talk about it, quote it all the time. I really enjoy it. I'm not as fixated as, it, as they are, but and it's fascinating that my wife is fixated on a uh, Adam Sandler comedy. But there it is. Um, yeah, we watched it a month ago. It's enjoyable. And it, apparently, reading it just now, has 20 minutes of outrageous deleted scenes. That's fun. Next up, we've got Ghostbusters, huge classic film from my childhood. Uh, I mean, I love this movie. I rewatch it every single year. There's some versions of it that have more special features than this version, so I wouldn't get this one. I'd be sure to get one that has good special features. It's a classic. There's plenty of versions that have cool stuff. This is just the one that I happen to have. It's not even I have a DVD. Why don't I have this on Blu-ray? I need to get a proper version of Ghostbusters. Next up, Ghost Town. Um... I don't really remember this movie at all, uh, really at all. It's got Taylor Leona, so that's probably why we own it. But um, overall, a movie so forgettable that I don't remember anything about it besides the cast to it. So I, there you go. I don't have anything really to say about that one. Next one, Nomeo and Juliet, a movie that we purchased on accident. And by we purchased on accident, I mean my sister-in-law purchased it on accident, not realizing she didn't have a Blu-ray player. And she's like, here, you guys can have this. And we were like... Thank you for this movie we're probably never going to watch. Next up, The Godfather. So, obviously, classic, classic film. One of the greats of all time. So you've got to own the first one and the second one. So I, I own the first one. Um, I don't even think we own... I think this is someone else's copy that they left at our house. So maybe I shouldn't mention that on here. This, I don't know if this is part of a collection that I don't have all the discs for it or what, but um, there's like no special features or there's just a commentary track that runs along with it. So that's kind of weird, but uh, I probably need to get a proper Blu-ray edition of The Godfather with special, special features and learn more about it. Next up, Good Will Hunting, a movie I saw in high school when it first came out in theaters. Great drama that in many ways... Uh, because of the layers to it, because of the understanding of people and phases of life and the emotional depth to the circumstances of it, it's a movie that you resonate with at different times at different phases of life, whether you're the person that kind of has love but you're a broken person, whether you're a person that has potential and you don't know what to do with it, whether you're the guy that's the Robin Williams that has all kinds of potential but chose family over just being a career type person, and you're thinking through all of that and dealing with colleagues and stuff that look down on you in different ways. There's many different ways to view the movie, but uh, I, I just love it. It's a great film. And one of those movies that you could always go back to and go, this Ben Affleck guy that's doing Geely, that he's doing Daredevil, that's doing all this stuff that's kind of embarrassing. Remember, this is a guy that's got talent, and then the last 10 years he made a huge comeback, and, um, you know, it was all the talent was always there. He just made some weird choices at times. Next up, The Great Outdoors. I've actually only think, seen this one one time. I don't even know why we own it, where it came from. But just kind of one of those 80s comedies that uh, didn't necessarily like transcend the, the decade or become a classic or anything like that. But you go back and it's good, solid entertainment starring some solid leads. Um, and you, you just notice how every decade has movies like this that you go, oh, wow, Dan Aykroyd and John Candy in a movie together. And this one, I think this one had a little bit more buzz back in the day, but it doesn't feel like it that that 
conversation and the chatter about it has continued. I don't hear many people talk about this one all that much, like I feel like they did back in the day. Next up, The Guardian, I, and we've never opened it. Um, so this is a good little thriller type movie that was actually the first movie my wife and I watched after we got married, <laughs> with all sorts of hilarious stories surrounding that. But um, so yeah, we. Um, I enjoyed it enough. I don't know why we haven't rewatched it and why we own it, but yeah, I don't know why that case is, but it's a, it's a solid movie that I find enjoyable enough um, that has a very specific memory for a very specific night in my life. Next up, Guardians of the Galaxy. I've said it many times. This is my favorite movie, the MCU. Such a pleasant surprise. I have so many fond memories tied to this mini movie and when I, when I went to go see it with some of my interns and things like that. So just all around, just like a huge surprise for how fun it was, how funny it was. Different take on the MCU, all sorts of things. Star-making performances that, um, you know, made me love it. And it, like all MCU movies, has a great set of special features. And then we got Hancock, a movie that is 60% very good movie and then 40% what? What were you thinking? So basically, if you haven't seen this one, the first 40% of the movie is the movie you think it's going to be and it's fun and it's funny. It's not great. It's not amazing, but it's it's definitely very enjoyable and the sort of thing that the trailers advertised and kind of what if Will Smith was a superhero that was a, a jerk. And that's what you get. And then... Right as it gets to like, you're getting like, oh, we're getting in the groove of things. Here, this gigantic flip everything upside down plot twist. And essentially the movie's bad sequel is the last third of the movie. And it just kind of like tacked onto the movie. And you're like, why did you do this? This is this is what bad sequels do that expand the mythology in weird directions and have plot twists that don't fit. Why did you do this? And so this movie is its own bad sequel. <laughs> it's both the good original and bad sequel all at once. So frustrating. It, it was so close to being really good. All right, then we'll make a big jump forward right here. And we'll do this big stack of Harry Potter movies. So for me, I've said it many times, I'm not a big Harry Potter fan. That's not my thing. But clearly, it's my wife's thing. So I've seen these out of order, mixed mashed order, all that kind of fun stuff at different times. Um, they're enjoyable enough. I can I understand why people, especially people that grew up with them, why, why they're so huge to them. It's not like, what? I think Voldemort's kind of... I, I'm a little bit weird as, as to why people think he's amazing, but the movies, the world building, all that, I totally get it. It's just, it's just not my thing, but, uh, very cool set of movies that they exist, that they were to pull that off with such little changing in the casting that the kid actors worked and a couple of them have gone on. Well, several have gone on to have become very successful adults. <laughs> Emma Watson, obviously. Um, but, and then, you know, some of the versions of them have great special features on there too. So that's nice. Ne next up, another Will Smith movie, Hitch. Um, pleasant enough, charming enough, but not one I ever really want to rewatch. It's just kind of like, oh yeah, there's a movie called Hitch that, uh, it's pleasant. I'd rather watch some other romantic comedy besides this one, but it does exist and it's not bad. Next up, The Holiday, one that many times in my life I've woken up at three in the morning and my wife watched it, fell asleep, and then the menu for the movie is just looping, playing the music for it, and it's a really nice little music theme, and then I looked it up and Hans Zimmer did the music for it. It's not like you think, The Holiday, what, a rom-com type movie? Why is... Hans Zimmer scoring that, but he did, and it's memorable. And it's and it's a rom-com type thing. Theme. It's not like big bombastic or the atmospheric type stuff or any of that stuff. It's just like a nice little charming piece of music that's memorable that I've woken up many times in the middle of the night to my wife uh, forgetting to turn the TV off. Next up, Home Alone 1 and 3. As has happened to be the case uh, several times here, I don't have the second movie in yet another trilogy of films. I don't know, is it a trilogy? Does the third one, is it supposed to be Kevin in the third one? Let me look this up. No, it's a totally different kid. Totally different, I don't I don't even know why they call it Home Alone. That's, that's frustrating. I don't even know if I've seen this one. I've, I think it might have kind of been on in the background before. But one and two, I grew up on those two. I saw them in the theater. I think one of my birthdays, I actually took my friends to go see Home Alone 2. I think that happened. But you know, I've seen Home Alone 50 times, I don't know. 30 times, certainly as many times as the movie, uh, or let's see, what came out in 90? Let's do some math real quick. 
1990, so I've seen it at least 26 times. So we'll call it, I've seen Home Alone 32 times will be my official answer. Next up, Hoosiers. A very cool sports movie, enjoyable. I felt like people used to talk about it more, and it's kind of, I don't hear them talking about it as much, but it's kind of Gene Hackman as an aging coach that, what you think, is aging coach, and it was back in the 80s when it came out, so he is old now. But Gene Hackman is this aging coach that had some big issues and trouble, and so he's kind of making a comeback. Gets hired for a team that doubts him and his abilities, and then they go on to try and have a winning season. This is a very cool DVD right here with a nice case and all sorts of fun stuff like that. So there's some very cool versions of Hoosiers out there. If you want a good sports movie that maybe you haven't seen, that people don't talk about as much when they talk about old sports movies, check out Hoosiers. It's been in the sports basketball. I don't know if I mentioned that. Next up, Hot Fuzz, an Edgar Wright, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost movie. Uh, maybe my favorite of the bunch. They're, they're all they're all pretty good. They're all good at what they're trying to do. But since I'm an action movie guy, this one might be my favorite of the bunch, just simply for that reason. Um, obviously, they're funny. They're actually pretty good at being the genre they're trying to be. So this is actually kind of decent in the action in this one and things like that. It's all in all very charming, fun movie to check out. Next up, The Hunger Games. I'm not actually a big fan of The Hunger Games, especially the the, the concept of the first one. It, it kind of weirded me out because I, I've always watched lots of those kind of like the most dangerous game, those types of movies where people being hunted or have to hunt each other. There's a movie called Mean Guns from the 90s that involved a bunch of grown men assassins trying to kill each other. And they're all like mean, nasty, violent movies made for people that like movies like that, like myself. And so when they made one, it's like, let's do that, except it's teenagers forced to do it. And it's let's make it for 14 year old girls. That it just always weirded me out a little bit the target audience for the nature of the movie. So very odd to me, but it's enjoyable enough and we own it. Next up, The Hunt for the Red October, the Jack Ryan movie starring Alec Baldwin that people kind of, it seems like people for, don't forget this movie, but they talk about Sean Connery being in it. They forget that Alec Baldwin was playing Jack Ryan in it, which is interesting to me. Uh, this is actually the most forgettable one for me. Um, I really like Clear and Present Danger, and this one's like, oh yeah, that's a Jack Ryan movie too. And so I, maybe it is forgettable. I don't know. I, it doesn't seem like people think it's forgettable. They just remember it for the wrong reasons at times. Next up, Hunted. A pretty forgettable movie. It's kind of kind of like the movie First Blood, uh, where there's a guy that's a military guy that's kind of gone rogue and kind of snapped a little bit, and he's being hunted down by the guy that trained him. So there's some pretty obvious comparisons to... Um, First Blood, but all in all, quite different. And if you want to watch First Blood or those that type of movie, watch First Blood. It's the better movie. Uh, I watched this a few times, always wanting to like it more than I did, and then I didn't like it more than I did. And we got Iron Man, a movie that I love just as much as I loved when it first came out almost 10 years ago. Next year, it'll be 10 years. Uh, just such a breath of fresh air in taking what was a B-level comic book character and making him the most lucrative of the Marvel characters, which is just crazy to think about that Iron Man, people didn't know who he was if they weren't comic book people. Like my wife didn't know who Iron Man was. She thought they'd made him up or it was just a movie. It's like, no, it's a comic book. Like, you, you have never heard of Iron Man? She said, no, I never heard of Iron Man. And then she loved it. And so it's such a cool story. Robert Downey Jr. kind of disappeared from movies for a while because he had serious personal issues and went to prison and all sorts of stuff happened. So casting him, like it's just really, it's a neat story to think that they took a B-level property, a washed up actor that was a huge liability and then turned them into really of the last 10 years, the most bankable character to, um, actor combination maybe we've had maybe of the last 10 years because how much money he's made playing that specific character and it's just a pretty cool score i like that stuff and i love the movie next up italian job a movie i didn't see this one in the theaters for some reason i don't even know why but then as times passed i've seen it several times and i've enjoyed it quite a bit just fun lively cast of people um and so just makes for a fun movie the heist movies are always kind of fun to watch and so there you go you got a good one right there with an amazing cast of people next up inside out uh, we actually saw this one for the first time at a church movie night and my kids were like can we see the movie with the, the people in it and movie with the people in it with the colors with the colors, angry, oh, inside out, yes. You can watch that movie, yes, we can pick that one up and they, their description of it was pretty incredible. So pick this one up, pretty neat little movie that they to come up with the idea and then they pulled it off. I, I, When I you know, first saw the trailers and the concept of it, I was like, what 
this is a kid's movie. What are you thinking? How's that going to work? And it did. So good on them. Next up, James and the Giant Peach. Another one that is unopened. I've never seen this movie. So I've never seen any of these special features. Um, so I can't say anything about it. But I do own it for some reason. My wife never even talked. I don't know even where this came from. Next up, we've got... Four Jaws movies in five different versions of their in the mix. Um, so two, three, and four, kind of forgettable. Three's my favorite of the, the ones. F Jaws Revenge is just awful. Jaws 3 being in 3D and having Dennis Quaid is just so goofy. It's good enough. Second one's a decent enough movie. It's better as a movie than Jaws 3, but Jaws 3 is so stupid, it's more enjoyable to me. This one's a little bit too much of a rehash. And these don't really have special features. There's not much to talk about. some production notes on the second one. Jaws, however, um, this, I guess, there, <laughs> backwards, what am I looking at? Jaws, however, is both a, one of the great movies of all time and some of the best DVD Blu-ray releases of all time. That's why we have two versions of it. So this one, I guess, is the 30th anniversary edition that has like a full book that came with it. Amazing set of special features, like a feature-length documentary about the making of it, where they got everybody, the author of the book, Steven Spielberg, surviving cast, talking about it. And then the Blu-ray version repackages a lot of that stuff, some new things, um, for the 100th anniversary of Universal Edition of the movie, which is a funny thing to re-release Jaws for the 100th in but they re-release this one all the time. But overall, just great movies with great versions of it. If you buy Jaws, you can normally find a great edition of it on sale somewhere. Um, but some of the best special features that you can find out there for that movie. Next up, Jingle All the Way. Um, it's a pretty forgettable, it would be a totally forgettable Christmas movie if not for Arnold being in it. That's kind of the end of the day. It's, uh, it's kind of fun to see him in a movie like this, but it's it's pretty forgettable. Yeah, that's right. Jake Lloyd's in it, too. So Anakin, kid Anakin Skywalker wanting a toy and his dad trying to fight to get it. Next up, Journey. The Journey of Natty Dan. I don't know what this is. I own it, though. John Cusack and uh, a dog. Never seen it. <laughs> Next up, we've got... Oh! Interesting. We have the Jurassic Park sequel collection. I don't have Jurassic Park, apparently. It means it's probably we did like a family movie some night or family vacation somewhere or at a family lake house and took a bunch of movies with us and then didn't bring it back. So I'm pretty sure I know where Jurassic Park is. We do own it, but not here today. So there you go. Um, all of them have pretty great special features talking about the making of it, kind of behind the scenes sorts of stuff. Uh, they're all watchable enough. If I were to rank them, it would be Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, Lost World, Jurassic Park 3. Jurassic Park 3 is pretty weird, but it's short enough, fast enough, and much adventure that it's a watchable, not good. And it's from Joe Johnston. He, he should, it's disappointing he made a bad Jurassic Park movie. And then the second one, it's like they're trying to do Jurassic Park, but just not as good. And then the first one is just the best movie of all time, a 10 out of 10 type movie for me. And like I said, the Blu-rays and stuff all have great special features. Next up... Hey, Reese Witherspoon. Uh, just Like Heaven, uh, not my favorite of her rom-com era, but great chemistry between the two of them. Just the premise of Ghost and types, all the where, where it went with things. Not really my kind of thing, but the cast is great. There's some humor in it. There's plenty to like in it. Another movie that I've woken up to the menu of the film many, many, many times in my wife for my wife putting it on, and then we both fall asleep, and then at three in the morning, the music's just cycling, or the movie would loop, or things like that. Oh yeah, this is another one of those, this one has Napoleon Dynamite in it as well. So once again, as I talked about a little bit earlier, where there's this era where it's like, let's put Napoleon Dynamite in this Reese Witherspoon rom-com. And there you have it. Next up, not really a movie, but it is on DVD. The Incredible Hulk, the original TV series. It's it's the movie, and then there's a second episode to it. I, I like the old TV show. If, if you've never seen it before, if you didn't grow up with it, it's it's very 70s. It's very dated, so it's probably difficult to, to enjoy to the full extent if you don't have kind of nostalgia for it, just the limitations of the budget, the nature of film or TV at the time. But I, I think it's pretty good um, for, for what it is, and I, I enjoyed the TV show growing up. 
Next up, The Informant, a film that I don't even remember what it is. Oh, directed by Steven Soderbergh. That would explain why I have it. Um, never watched it. I've owned, I own it, obviously. It's not a Steven Soderbergh people mention a lot, and it was, it was like a dollar at Blockbuster, so I bought it. I mean, they just had stacks of it. That's, that's my memory of that movie, is just stacks of The Informant at Blockbuster that nobody wanted to buy, and they were dirt cheap, so I bought one of them. Next up, I Love You, Man, another movie that I've seen one or two times that I own that um, at the same time is pretty forgettable and not one that like I've like rushed out to go see a bunch of times or anything like that or um, care too much about. I like the cast to it, you know, fun little bromance movie, but one that really I bought because Blockbuster was going out of business, and so that's the price before the price really, really started to drop as they ran out of money. Next up! The Hot Shots Duology. So I saw these movies both in the theater when they came out. So they're kind of the spoof movies of my age. Those are the Naked Gun movies. Um, I, I never in love with these. Even back then, I didn't think that they were that amazing. I thought they were funny enough, enjoyable enough. At some point in time, I saw this DVD set for under 10 bucks, so I bought it. I don't even remember when that... I forgot that I owned this until I was like moving my DVDs, and I was like, oh, yeah, I have the Hot Shots movies. Maybe I should rewatch those one of these days... Probably not going to happen anytime soon. However, a set that I rewatch very frequently, of course, is Indiana Jones, The Complete Adventure. So, of course, I love the first three of these ones. The fourth one, I don't think it's as bad as most people say it is, but things in it are just as bad as people say they are. But I think there's some redeeming qualities in it. It's a, a movie that could, it could have been better with certain tweaks. I made a whole video about how to fix that, that movie. Anyway, that's a different thing altogether. There's a ton of great versions of Indiana Jones uh, out there. They've re-released it many times with like feature-length documentary about the making of the movies. They're great, great special features. So make sure you get one of the sets that has has great special features. Actually, at one point, I, one of the one things that got robbed from me was that my old set that I had of the Indiana Jones movies, and it had a specific disc that had the special features that were amazing. And then when I had to rebuy them, I bought one of the crappy re-releases of it that I think, yeah, crappy re-release that didn't have all the cool special features. And so I actually found a friend that gave me his copy of the special feature. I was so grateful for it, but because it, it's the special feature documentary feature leaked one from the release from like, I think, I don't know. I don't know, like 25th anniversary edition or something like that of Raiders um, was really good. And so I've got a great one now. So be sure to get a good copy when you get that one. Next up, Inception, one of my favorite Christopher Nolan movies that I don't watch very often. So this one, actually, I own it and I haven't actually watched this copy of it. Yet. I'm not quite sure why that is. There's actually no reason to it. It's one of those movies that other people want to show other people and I'm around when they watch it. And so I haven't watched my copy of it, but I own a copy of it and I love this movie. I just end up watching it at other people's houses all of the time just through the way the universe has worked. Next up, Iron Will, another solid uh, movie from my childhood that seems to have been forgotten. Uh, it's memorable to me because it was a movie we watched in our youth group a lot, and some of the quotes from it we used as, like, mottos in our youth group. And so I've thoroughly enjoyed this movie throughout my life. It's a good one. It's got Kevin Spacey in it, actually. But a movie kind of forgotten by time, even though it's it's, I don't know, it's a really enjoyable movie about a guy that has to do this sled race and everyone doesn't think that he can do it, but he runs longer and sleeps less. It's really the motto for my life. Next up, The Karate Kid Collection, the original four films. People forget that there was a one with Hilary Swank as well as Walton Goggins in it, but uh, it exists. It is out there in the universe so, uh, yeah, obviously the first one's a great movie, one of my favorite movies of all time. And then parts two and three have nostalgia for me, and part four exists. So I own all of them. I watch them pretty frequently. This one has some commentary tracks on the first film, but it doesn't have any special features. I don't know if there's a version of The Karate Kid that has great special features. I hope there is, that they, they kind of documented that pretty well. But, like, the director of the first one died this year. Pat Morita died, like, ten years ago. So I don't know. You kind of lose a little bit in some of those types of things. Fun fact, the guy that wrote these movies, um, Roger Mark Kamen, what's his name? What is, how do I say it? Um, yeah, Robert Mark Kamen. Yeah, I said that right. He was one of the guys that wrote Taken. He wrote all the Taken movies, too, with Luke Besson. Fun random fact. That's a weird career right there. And next up, one of my favorite Van Damme films. There's a lot of favorite Van Damme films for me. Kickboxer. So him out to avenge his brother 
Um, yeah, it's dumb. It's cheesy. It's a type of movie that if you didn't grow up with this kind of thing, you'd probably be like, what is this? I got some people to watch it like a couple months. I loaned it to them a year ago and they just watched it a couple months ago. And, uh, I, I have no idea what they actually thought about it. Cause they're like, yeah, we watched it, which I, I don't know how, if, what they thought about it, but it's, it's a classic. You gotta, gotta watch Kickboxer. Then we get to Kindergarten Cop. A movie from my childhood, which has new meaning for me right now as my son started kindergarten just about a month ago. So we've been meaning to rewatch this one. So I'll just put this one right here as another one to watch this weekend. But a uh, very fun movie. Well, being pretty dark. Well, like I, at the age I would have seen it, which would have been elementary school in the theaters. Um, it's some pretty dark stuff in there. It's not really a kid's movie, though. There's some kiddie type things in there. And there are a lot of kids in the movie as it takes place in kindergarten. Next up. L.A. Confidential, very solid crime thriller action type thing from the late 90s. And it's a uh, you got Russell Crowe before Gladiator in it. And it was those guys like Guy Pierce that has been one of those guys for 20 years now that you've seen him in tons of stuff. He's been solid in a ton of stuff, but it never feels like he went all the way up to the A-list. He started in a few things, but nothing that kind of like cracked into the that kind of the vibe of who the A-list is. So very cool little movie, solid, solid um, film. Then we got Lady and the Tramp. I haven't seen this in like 20 years. Probably need to watch it with the kids. This is the 50th anniversary edition of the movie. So yeah, one my kids love dogs. So I'll, another one, I'll put this one right here. So maybe play that one for the kids later today. Next up, Land of the Dead, one of George, or I think this is George Romero's first zombie movie to come out after kind of the revival with um, 28 Days Later and then Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead and then Land of the Dead came out. Just uh, real cool George Romero, new take after 20 year absence of doing uh, movies in his Dead series. And then he came back and did this one. Um, really enjoyed it. My wife actually kind of enjoyed it, which she doesn't watch zombie movies, so I don't know what was the... I don't know if she just was in a really good mood the t day that we watched this one, but she liked it. This copy obviously isn't opened. Um, I'm pretty sure that's because our original copy of it was stolen, so we rebought it and just haven't rewatched it since then. Next up, The Last Unicorn, one of those movies from your childhood that you remember being creeped out because there's Red Bull and the way it cuts to is real creepy. All my memories of this are so weird and strange and the music and these odd images and stuff. And then my wife's like, oh, I love this movie. We should get it. And so she watched it. And then I walked in and got freaked out by it because it's a it's a creepy movie. <laughs> Maybe you like it, but uh, it creeps me out. Then we got the Lego movie. Actually, but we have the I think we have the British edition of it, which does play on our stuff, but the HD codes and stuff didn't work. I don't like some I guess someone got it for us for Christmas off of Amazon and <laughs> ordered it from the wrong continent, which is hilarious. But there you go. We've got um Lego movie, obviously a you know, fun, crazy, chaotic, ADD animated film ushering this new phase of how to do animated films that and all these new Lego movies with Ninjago coming out in just a few days. So my kids being in the Lego phase of life and loving Lego Ninjago, Lego movies are huge with them, as well as the Lego video games. Uh, next up... The Miserables. The one from the 90s with Liam Neeson, actually, and Jeffrey Rush. So not the one that came out a few years ago that was a musical. Uh, I've never seen this. It's not open. I didn't buy this. I guess my wife bought it. There you go. It's a thing that I own that I haven't seen. Next up, four Lethal Weapon movies. If you're counting how many movies I'm doing, I don't know how many you count this one for, but there are four Lethal Weapon movies in here. Uh, I, I mean... I probably love all of them. Um, two of them are way better than the other two, but the two that are less good are still very enjoyable, solid buddy cop action movies. One of them even has Jet Li in it. The first two are two of the be absolute best buddy cop movies, maybe the two best buddy cop movies. I love this series, love these movies. Um, Richard Donner is one of my favorite directors, and this is one of the reasons he is one of my favorite directors, because he has so much uh, ability to do different genres, including this one and Goonies, and inventing the superhero movie with Superman the movie. Next up, License to Wed. Um, don't know why I own this one. It's not good. It's very... It's one of those movies that you're like, oh, Robin Williams, John Krasinski, you're better than this. Mandy Moore. Yeah, it's, it's probably on your level. But... 
two of these people, why did you do this movie and we own it? So I don't know. I, don't, I guess we maybe we bought it because it was cheap. And we're like, oh, it's just five bucks. Let's buy it instead of renting it. And we would never rewatched it. I think we even got it before we had kids. And there's some stuff, all sorts of stuff in it that uh, had. There we go. I own it. It's embarrassing. Next one, one I'm not embarrassed to own, The Lion King. Of course, the classic um, Disney film from my childhood. This is probably the, the last of the Disney animated films that I enjoyed as a kid. And then the next was Pocahontas. And by then, I was a little bit old enough that that wasn't my thing anymore. I don't even, I don't even think I saw Pocahontas in the theater. Uh, it's like, like 10 years off from seeing animated films in the theater. But So this is the last one. I was like, mind blown, The Lion King. It's amazing. Uh, and I, I think he, I saw it at a drive-in theater, actually. It was pretty cool. Um, uh, one half was playing the, the Lion King. It was a double feature Lion King and something else over there. And the other side was, I don't remember what the first movie was, but the second one was True Lies. So I watched The Lion King with the first movie, and then I ran over to watch True Lies on the second half. Now that's a double feature right there. Next up, Limitless. Uh, enjoyable little thriller with a fun idea of what if there were pills that made you really smart. Um... The script's not quite as smart as the characters in the movie, but still very enjoyable little movie. Um, Bradley Cooper, right at that time where he's establishing himself as the leading man, so I, I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I also enjoyed the TV show that they made out of it last year. Then we have the brave little engine, or the little engine that could. Somewhere my kids saw this on like Amazon Prime, and Liam loved it. And my wife was creeped out by it. I thought it was awful. I walked in on it a couple times. They're like, "Are you kidding me? This is the one of the worst things I've ever seen." And it's got like Jamie Lee Curtis, Whoopi Goldberg, um, like some real names worked on it. But but it's it's, t- it's like it's terrible. And then for some reason, my wife bought it for Liam, and we even tried to hide it a few times from him and stuff. But there was a little while that I don't know why she bought it. That was such a bad life choice. Little Women is a movie I've never seen. And hopefully never will see, but we own it. Apparently my wife doesn't watch it much either, but it is a film in our home. And the Cody Leach pick, The Long Kiss Goodnight. It's an action movie from Rennie Harlan. It's a movie that I always thought I would really like, and every time I watch it, I don't like it as much as I think I'm doing. It's just like even the plot of it, the premise, and amnesia, and abilities, all the kind of some born identity, proto-born identity type stuff. Samuel Jackson, all these, like Shane Black worked on the script. All those great signs that I'm going to love this movie. And every time I've watched it, I've just never loved it. So another one, I told Cody Leach that I was going to watch this movie again. Give it another try. Like for fourth time, I've tried to like it. So I'll put this one off to the side as well to save for later. Next up, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. Um, I don't know why this happens to be the one that I have. It was, I guess because it was only $5. And man, like just picking it up, it's heavy. Like there's... I don't know how many discs are in here, but um, it's, you know, the full movie plus some special features plus a booklet for $5. So a good deal. I'm not the biggest Lord of the Rings fan, but that is a good set right there. There's There's a ton of great Lord of the Rings. I don't know if any of the Lord of the Rings releases have been bad. They're all pretty good. And as you can see, sometimes you can get them really cheap, too. That's not a movie. Then we've got... The Majestic, a movie that I hadn't seen in, I haven't, I don't think I've seen this since it was in the theater, picked up because it was cheap, and I'd forgotten that Frank Darabont directed this. So like, Frank Darabont, the guy that did the Shawshank Redemption, The Mist, and then uh, uh, Walking Dead fame, all sorts of, like, stuff that's been really well-respected. Somewhere in there he did The Majestic, which I enjoyed enough. It's okay, but... I own it, and I haven't rewatched it. Maybe I need to rewatch this one, too. Not so much I'm going to put it in this stack here. It's still going to get put in this stack over here, but The Majestic, it's a movie. Jim Carrey, Frank Darabont. Hmm. Then we got Major League. I really like this movie. Just a fun little charming sports movie with Charlie Sheen before he was crazy. Really, the whole cast, Rene Russo's in there. Um, David Palmer from 24's in there. There's tons of people throughout this whole movie. They're like, hey, that guy's in this. Wesley Snipes, some kind of, maybe it's kind of breakout star performance just a fun sports movie it's not trying to be like the best movie ever it's not trying to be anything like that so no no pretenses just solid entertainment i really like that movie then you have major league two more of that same movie but not as fun and they replaced wesley snipes with i forget the actor's name he was on it omar epps it replaced him with omar epps who's not 
Wesley Snipes. So it's just an odd pick to replace Wesley Snipes. Uh, just it brings a totally different energy, um, but doesn't just it's not awful. I don't hate it. it. It's watchable enough. I think my disc's actually scratched. Yeah, not scratched. I don't even know why it's still in here. It's cracked. It's literally snapped like in half. I don't know if you can see that. But the yeah, you can see the, the disc actually snapped, so I'm going to put it back in my collection. And it's super duper blockbustery with stickers on top of it and everything. But watch the first Major League. Don't watch the second one. Then, continuing in this series, Major League 3 with Scott Bakula in the lead now. I don't... I think I've only seen this one once. Maybe I need to rewatch this one to see if I like it more. Because I, I have fond memories of Spot, Scott Bakula because of Quantum Leap. And then he was Archer on Star Trek Enterprise, but... Uh, I think I've only seen this one time. I, I guess they had a super sale at Blockbuster or something when they were going out of business. So I bought them. One of them's cracked. One of them's a movie that I haven't really seen. Next up, Man of Steel. I I, I got no issues with Man of Steel. I really like Man of Steel. I, I don't really understand some of it. I understand kind of the dislike, the disappointment in it because of the direction they went. And if you do something creative and different, people aren't going to like it. Fair enough. But there's some hate for it too. And I don't, I don't get any of that. It's a thing that if you're a purist, you're like, I don't like this because I'm a purist. Fair enough. I'm not even going to try and argue with you. I totally get what you're saying. Some of the other people aren't even like that, so I get confused by them. But I really enjoyed this one. Very solid film. Don't remember this one having good special features, though. That's disappointing. It's a movie I'd like to see good special features on. Then we got The Matrix. Um, great sci-fi. I actually didn't like this one all that much the first time I saw it in the theaters. Like, I didn't hate it. I was never negative on it. But at the time it came out, I was really into John Woo movies. Really into the Terminator. And everything except anime that this is based on. Yuan Wuping uh, is the fight coordinator. I was really into Hong Kong cinema and martial arts films at the time. So when it came out, besides the anime side to it, I was all very much into the, all the stuff it was based off of. So then I saw this one. I was like, oh, it's kind of like the Terminator, except with Yuan Wuping's fight choreography. And you mix in a little bit of John Woo gunplay. Wow, I've seen all this before. It's just kind of stupid, stupid sorts of thoughts because the, it, it mixes them together wonderfully. It's, it creates its own unique thing that plays homage to a ton of things. It's very, not in any way like Quentin Tarantino in the sense of you know, it's not it's, you don't just watch it and think, oh, Quentin Tarantino did that at all. But in the way that Quentin Tarantino takes all of these things that influenced him and sometimes even plot points or actors that he likes and he put them all into a movie together. That's what the Wachowskis did with The Matrix. And it, it's aged so well. I had a phase where I couldn't really watch it because of the sequels were so bad. Um, and they screwed up the mythology, and that's what that's the thing that makes them horrible. Is that they like what makes this one cool is largely the mythology and the world they built, and then they deconstruct it and tear it apart in the end of the second one, and then going into the third one. So there's versions of this that have great special features. I don't know if this one does. There's like this thing called The Matrix Revisited that came out that's an amazing set of special features for it, like feature length documentary, all about how all those guys went to boot camp and training on how to use all this stuff and how they did everything. Great set of special features uh, um, for The Matrix, the, the first one. From there, Memento. Now, here's where I'm going to spend a bunch of time crying about stolen DVDs. So I used to have like the super ultimate edition DVD of Memento. If you don't know, Memento is Christopher Nolan's first movie that had a, a budget. So he had a movie he did before this that was like $8,000 budget. This one's the first one, like million dollars, $2 million budget. Um, you know, you, you got some actors in there that you've seen of Guy Pierce once again, uh, Gary Moss from uh, The Matrix fame. Is that Gary Moss? Did I get that one right? Yeah, Gary Ann Moss. There's, I was thinking like there, there's a model with a name similar that I've, mix them up from time to time but so um very solid but the movie's told in reverse order and they put out a version of the dvd for it that has all these special features on the writing of it the making of it, commentary and then there's a cut of the movie that's in chronological order so they re-edited the entire movie to 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 be in order and that version of it got stolen criminals Next up, we got Men in Black. Uh, so I was in middle and high school during the peak of Will Smith's boom. So, you know, the, with Men in Black, uh, Independence Day, just kind of like this out of nowhere, Will Smith goes from popular rapper guy, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air guy, to A-list movie star that we are absolutely in love with Will Smith. 
I was there for that boom. I was that boom. You know, we men in black with the favorite song of that year. And so then, I mean, this is the movie that we talked about for like an entire year, entire summer. I mean, everyone loved, love, 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 love this movie. And I still love, love, love this movie. Uh, it's a fun one that, hey, not too long from now, I can show my kids and have a lot of fun with it with them. But a very cool movie. Um, I don't know. There's probably a better version of the Blu-ray than this one. At least it doesn't look like it had very many special features. There's got to be a good one of that. Next up, we've got Miss Congeniality. Um, I think I've seen this a couple of times before. Not my favorite Sandra Bullock movie. That is, of course, would either be Speed, Demolition Man, or While You Were Sleeping, depending on what kind of mood you're in. Those three are all amazing. This one exists, and I, I guess it's enjoyable enough. I don't remember William Shatner in this one. I don't remember if he's in both of them or just one of them, but that was fun to see him in there. Hey, another Hugh Grant movie. This one's kind of, I think my wife's favorite Hugh Grant movie. It's kind of a forgotten film because he's got some other ones that have popped a little bit more. Uh, this is probably the one that gets played the most in our house. Maybe music and lyrics a little bit more, but those two get, are the two we watch all the time. But uh, Mickey Blue Eyes, just a fun one where Hugh Grant uh, ends up dating um, Jean Triplehorn, wants to marry her, but her dad's like a crime boss, and it leads to a series of hilarious hijinks where they eventually there's miscommunications and they break up and have to get back together, like every rom comedy. But it's a fun little one, and of course, he's delightful. Next up, we've got mil Millions. Millions? I don't know what this is. Let me read the back real quick, see if I can find anything that would explain to me what it is or why I own it. I can't, but I own it. Next up, we've got four Mission Impossible movies. Don't own the latest one on Blu-ray yet, but own the other ones. I love this series. Uh, the first one came out right before I was in high school. So one of those movies that kind of defined, you know, kind of some of my young years of just enjoying, um, you know, action spy type movies. The second one came out right after I graduated high school. So the soundtrack, I own the soundtrack, some of the, all the big, there are several big hit singles that came out of it. That's some of the people for, I don't know why you would even remember that if you're not my age, cause it's not like it's memorable. But for me at the time, the soundtrack for mission impossible two was kind of this big deal. At the time it came out, I was big into John Woo, as I mentioned when I was talking about the matrix. And so that the John Woo directed the second was this huge thing. I thought it was going to be amazing. Then I watched it and I was like, even back then, as, as dumb young me was like, oh, not so much. Sorry. Sorry on this one. Why didn't I just... Oh, wait a minute. Two copies of Miss Congeniality? What is going on here? Well... Whoops. Uh, so I guess I have two copies of Miss... Miss Congeniality. Uh... And I just broke this one. Yeah, the disc popped out. Uh, we'll just leave this in there. Anyway, I don't have any new thoughts since the last time I talked about it two minutes ago. Next on Moulin Rouge. I feel like everyone likes Moulin Rouge more than I do. I don't... I have no fond memories of Moulin Rouge. I'm, oh, well, actually, my fond memories of Moulin Rouge is um, when I was in college... Um, and actually living in the dorms my freshman year, which was 2005, even though it should have been the year 2000. I went off to college five years late. I was in the dorms when I was 23 or something. And every Saturday morning, there was some guy that would just start blasting Phantom of the Opera and the Elephant Medley from Moulin Rouge early in the morning. That's what I would wake up to when I was in college for several years. And so that's my memories of this one. I, and even yesterday, yesterday I was listening to the Elephant med Love Medley um, in my car. It shows up in a lot of my Apple playlists because I listen to it a lot and... Just yesterday, I was listening to that one song. That's my memories for Moulin Rouge. I mean, I guess I get the production's really cool, but some people that are, like, really into it, it's like, suddenly you're really into prostitution? Where did that come from? Then we got Murder by the Numbers. This one must be one my wife got because it's full screen. Sandra Bullock. There's so many Sandra Bullock things right here. Most of them are um, Miss Congeniality, but here's one more of them. Uh, I, I've never seen this. I, I don't... I imagine it's about a murder, but and it's a by the numbers thriller. But yeah, I never seen this one. Wait, Ryan Gosling's in this from two thousand two. I'll put this one on this second list over here to check this one out because I didn't realize Ryan Gosling was in. He's actually right there on the cover. You guys have been looking at him this whole time. I'm getting quite the list of movies I need to check out this week. So. Next up, we've got The Mummy. So I only own the, own the first one on, on Blu-ray. I guess I own this one. I didn't even realize I own this one on Blu-ray. I think I got the code from it from a, um, 
almost sideways. Sorry, I didn't mean to take it from someone else. But anyway, yeah, I, I've never been the biggest... Uh, I wasn't like a big, gigantic, mind-blown fan by these. They're just like a fun adventure series that from time to time you like to put them in and just have some fun. That's what these movies have been to me. And so, yeah, that's all I have to say about that one. Continuing our theme of Hugh Grant and Drew Barrymore rom-coms, music and lyrics. I really enjoy this movie because I really enjoy the two leads. I enjoy making music, and so it all kind of ties together as a movie that's very pleasant and enjoyable for me. Also, a lot of the side characters in it are people that you remember from TV shows you've seen or some of the people from The Daily Show are in it. So there's a bunch of things that just make this one very cute, charming, and fun. I'm surprised that it didn't, didn't do better in theaters and doesn't have kind of a more... of People don't remember it more because it's a very pleasant little film. Next up, we've got My Big Fat Greek Wedding. We're such big fans of it that this is unopened like many of our other films. Um, I don't remember if I saw this one in the theaters. I might have. I mean, it was in the theaters for forever. I mean, like six months. So I probably eventually saw it in there. And like everyone else, it's just a charming, fun little film that um, just just works uh, on, on kind of all the levels and just has a, 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 a charm, humor to it that just pops in a unique sort of way that you can totally understand how this was a movie that just stayed in theaters forever and went on to make buck lo bucket loads of money, tons and tons of money, even though it opened up in the theaters not very modestly and just never left because people just kept being like, you got to check this movie, you got to check this movie out. And if you haven't checked this one out, you got to check it out. It's a very fun, charming rom-com. From there, we've got My Fellow Americans. Um... I forgot this movie existed. I don't think I've seen it. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've actually seen this movie before, so I don't have anything to say about it. Uh, I don't even know how I own it, where it came from. Maybe my wife had it. Interesting. The things you learn while shooting videos. Next up, these two are stuck together. All right, we'll go Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Uh, this is a movie that's actually not quite as good as I always remember it being, but the Parts in it that are really good are just as good as I remember being, but the plot gets a little bit bogged down at certain points in time in it. There's some history to it that makes it taints the experience a little bit. But like, it's a movie that's just jam packed with uh, fun humor, comedy, side characters like Vince Vaughn's in it, Adam Brody's in it, Doug Lyman, as I've mentioned before, very solid director, two leads, kind of um, in with so much chemistry they got married for ten years awkwardly since he was already married. Um, but all in all, just very solid movie. Not as great as you want it to be. Not as great as my memory always tells me it is. But very enjoy enjoyable, solid film. Um, if you haven't seen it, you should check that one out. And one, not quite from my childhood, but maybe my teenage years because I have a sister. Much Ado About Nothing. A Kenneth Branagh Shakespearean comedy. And in stunning, incredible cast with one exception right there. <laughs> One of the worst castings in film history. Like, otherwise you got this movie that's funny, charming, and then Keanu Reeves is just in a different movie. A very bad, different movie with horrible acting that's just dreadful. And then this charming film all around it. So if you haven't seen this one, another one you gotta, gotta see. And then a stunning performance from Keanu Reeves, who should not, not, not be doing Shakespeare at all. Then we've got My Dog Skip. Don't know what it is. Moving on. <laughs> I don't even know where it came from. Then, uh, when you're married, there are certain movies you own that you've never seen. Mine is My Fair Lady. Um, yeah, I've never seen My Fair Lady. I'm okay with that. But it looks like it's a great, great DVD Blu-ray set thing because it's got tons of speech special features. Nice and heavy. Very cool packaging for this movie. I have no interest in I had to read... I think I read the screenplay for it in high school. Like, that's was one of our English assignments was and it had the pictures and everything and even at the time I was like this seems like a weird way to study this I guess if you're talking about adaptations of things and I guess that makes sense but that's weird then moving on to my my collection of Christian Bale movies I haven't seen Newsies so I remember this one from my childhood I'm sure my sister watched it all the time and listened to the music because she's into musicals and things like that then I forgot about it, and by the time I was married and then realized my wife was really into it, Christian Bale became, well, Christian Bale, this super famous guy that everybody knows who he is. And then you go, hey, look, Christian Bale's singing and dancing back in the year 1990, set back in the 20s, 10s, 
Uh, I can't find out what year what year the movie's taking place, but a long time ago. So anyway, apparently people, some people love this. I'm not one of the. Oh, Bill Pullman's in it too. So I learned that. I never watched it though. I many times I've been in the other room sleeping, and my wife's been in the other room. Da 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 da. And I just hear that from the other room, and it drives me bonkers. There's also a version of it that um, one of the actors from I think Supergirl is in the current Broadway version of it, musical version that's like on Netflix right now or something like that. I don't know the story because I don't care enough about Newsies, but that's a thing that exists. Then my collection of National Treasure movies, all three of them, and by three, I mean I own two copies of National Treasure 2. Um, I didn't realize that. I should probably pull one of these off. We should probably, well, I, well, I don't need it. I don't, I'm talking to myself right now. I don't know why I'm talking to myself in front of you guys, but... So I, I really enjoy those movies. I talked about it, I think, in a live stream, just a couple of these. I have no problem with those movies. They're, they're, they're very good at what they're supposed to be, which is a fun adventure for the whole family, and that's what they are, both of them. I, I, I'm shocked there isn't a third one. There really there should be a third one. I don't know why there isn't. Then we've got Night of the Museum. Started showing these to my kids a little bit ago, about a month ago, and um, yeah, I don't have much to say about them. Once again, in fine family entertainment, doesn't have too much fart humor and stuff like that, so I guess I like them more than most things. Pretty great cast in both of them, but not something I'm jumping up and down to see. But of movies that my kids might watch, um, less frustrating than most. Then we've got Scott Atkins' Ninja. So these are movies specifically for a particular crowd of people that like martial arts movies and don't mind the direct-to-video kind of junky ones. It's a junkie straight-to-video martial arts movie with some pretty cool fight scenes, CGI blood, things like that. It exists. I own it. Fair enough. Then we come up to The Notebook, one of those pivotal movies that came out while I was dating my wife or right after I was dating my wife. And so it came out on Blu-ray or excuse me, DVD when we were dating. So we watched this all the time back in the day. We actually went to several of the places where it was filmed because I went to school out in that part of the country and drove out to some of the locations, romantic locations, for romantic evenings. And then nine months later, we had children. That didn't happen. That part's not true. That was just a joke. Pretty crass joke for my channel as well. My wife sees this. She'll probably get mad at me for saying that. Very enjoyable movie. If you don't like Nicholas Sparks books and movies, this is the one that you'll probably like. It has the delightful Ryan Gosling and the delightful Rachel McAdams and all in all, a delightful little film that you got to check out. Uh, especially if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend. It's 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 magical. Next up, Oblivion, a movie that I got for free from someone about six months ago. Same with when I got Ghost Rider. That, uh, um, yeah, it was pretty disappointing. I we seemed kind of matri Matrixy maybe type vibe from the trailers. And then it was written by Michael Arndt, who was at the time writing Star Wars The Force Awakens. Movie came out and it was kind of, hmm, not as good as I want this to be. Not... Yeah, not, not working as great as I wanted to. And then he got pulled from The Force Awakens and Michael Arndt kind of disappeared into obscurity. Was the first person run over by the Kathleen Kennedy train. Next up, uh, October Sky. Jake Gyllenhaal. Unopened. Never seen it. And next up, Oliver and Company. This might be the first movie I've ever seen, I've ever saw in the theater. I'm not sure. I think I remember seeing this in the theater. Maybe if my sister's watching this, she'll be able to chime in and either confirm that's true or not. But it would have come out before Batman and Star Trek V. So I think this is 1988 or 87. So I might have seen this in the theater. It might be my first theater experience. Haven't seen it since then. So 30 years since I've seen that movie. Then we've got Office Space Unopened. Seen it many times. It's on TV all the time. And I see it in other places. Owned it because I enjoy it quite a bit. But I um, haven't actually opened my copy of it. But yeah, fun little office comedy about how ridiculous office are before The Office came out. But it has office in the title. And I've said the word office maybe more times in the last 20 seconds of my life than any of other previous 20 seconds of my life. Next up, 101 Dalmatians. Um, yeah, obviously a Disney classic uh, that's enjoyable enough. I don't even know where this came from. I think a bunch of people gave us stacks for their old movies, so we have a bunch of these classic Disney movies that I forget because we have so many of them that even just cycling through them it would take them, you know, two months to watch through all of them. But uh, there we go. I've got late uh, 101 Dalmatians right there. Um, I need to show it to my kids now that they're old enough to appreciate it and are in love with dogs. Then we've got the Painted Veil. I, 
Once again, another movie. I don't know what it is, where it came from. This one in particular, I really don't know what this movie is. I have no clue what this is. Some of them are like, oh, I kind of mildly remember this one. I have no clue. Then Pan's Labyrinth. I've never seen this. I know I should have. I own it. It's right here in my hand. And I've never seen Pan's Labyrinth. So that's weird. So I, by default, I'll put it in the must watch stack right over here. Um, but I I don't know why. It's, you know, obviously Guillermo del Toro's, you know, one of those movies that people like point to as one of his classics. Never seen it. Then we got The Patriot, another Mel Gibson violent movie that I thoroughly love. A little bit of revisionist history going on there, making the British look a little bit too bad and the, uh, the revolutionists look a little bit uh, too nice and squeaky clean. But all in all, a movie I thoroughly enjoy because I thoroughly enjoy pretty much everything with this Mel Gibson fellow in it. Then purchased about a month ago two Pink Panther movies. Uh, I'd never seen either one of them until about a month ago, and now I've seen one of them. I haven't shown them the second one yet. My kids watch the Pink Panther cartoons all the time, and so we got these to see if that how that would work. Uh, they're not the same thing. Not the same sense of humor or anything like that. Moving along, Pitch Perfect. When We didn't see this one in the theaters, and my wife rented it. And I, I didn't, I like, fell asleep before she even started it. And I woke up at, like, 5 in the morning, and she was still up, and she was watching it for the third time in a row. And I was like, are you, like, are you in love with the movie? Like, why are you watching this for the third time? Go to bed. And she's like, no, nah, it's only okay. No, she loves Pitch Perfect. She loves the second one. She's in love with these movies, watch them all the time. She lied to me and told me that she didn't love them. That's, I don't know why. It's like she was just trying to be contrary, and she knew that too many people liked them, and people kept telling her, you're going to like this, you're going to like this, and then she did. She didn't want to just give in too quickly, but she loves them. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoy them, too. I think they're a lot of fun. The third one looks dreadful. Then we got Prometheus. I'm not even going to put it with my other alien movies the way I normally sort my movies. Um, I don't. I don't. I did not care for this at all. And it's, it's all a mythology thing. I don't, there's certain types of mythology changes that you do with movies where you just answer too many questions or change the nature of the backstory and go in directions that I just, I just don't care for it. And that's, was the case with, with Prometheus that it, it just gave answers to questions I didn't want answers to and too much information about things I was curious about and changed things in a way that just was very off putting to me. So I didn't like this one at all. All right, we are about two hours into this thing. I don't actually don't know how far into it is. And we're only about halfway done. So I'll start trying to speed up once again. Next up, we got Paycheck. Uh, it's, I, I've never had big issues with it. I've never loved this movie. It's based off a Philip K. Dick story, which I love his stuff. Real smart, kind of brain trippy, what if type scenarios. With really clever ideas like Total Recall was one of them. Um, Blade Runner's based off of his stuff. And this one's directed by John Woo, which seems like a really weird pick for that. But oh, I rewatched it actually about a week ago, and not great, but good enough. Then you got Patriot Games, another Jack Ryan film. This one, another one with Harrison Ford, uh, and another one that I would kind of describe as kind of forgettable. In that, if I'm gonna watch one, I'm gonna go clear in present danger if I'm gonna go with the Harrison Ford one so uh, I, I just always even kind of struggled to remember what the plot of this one was where clear and present danger just always seemed co so clear and present in my mind next up Pee-wee's Big Adventure I grew up watching Pee-wee's TV show back in the day and watching this movie so this one has all sorts of nostalgia for me then re-watching it as an adult it 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 works much better. It's just like this weird, freaky movie where as a kid, you're like, hey, he's riding a bike and going to the Alamo. And then you're like, wow, Tim Burton and Pee-wee are so weird. So eh, it has a certain charm to it. Next up, the original Pete's Dragon. Um, I think we got, someone gave this to us fairly recently is how we ended up having this one. But this is one of those movies that was always on TV on Saturday afternoon. So I remember watching like the first 30 minutes, the last 30 minutes, all out of order. But I didn't own it growing up, but I saw it so, 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 so many times back in the day. But yeah, Pete's Dragon, um, I guess it was kind of cool for its time because it was a blend of live action with uh, animation, which at the time was uncommon. So that's pretty cool. Next up, we got another one of those John Grisham movies I was talking about. This one with uh, Julianne, or, or Julia Roberts and Denzel Washington in it. Another one I saw in the theaters way back in the day. Not as memorable or as good as The Firm, but still a solid movie. And one of those movies that you look back at it now and 
uh, especially, you know, Julia Roberts and Denzel just becoming so iconic uh, and all the time since this came out. It's fun to see them back much younger 25 years ago in, in this film. Then we've got The Phantom of the Opera with starring Gerard Butler from right before his... Uh, he exploded because of his ability to beat up people while wearing a Speedo. So um, I've seen it. I think I've seen it one time or something. Not something I care too much uh, care too much about. It's from Joel Schumacher, which is kind of interesting that Joel Schumacher did Batman and Robin, and he did this. But um, yeah, it's a thing that I own. Next up, Pitch Black. We talked about the Chronicles of Riddick before and had only seen it one time. This one I've actually seen several different times. I saw it in the theater when it first came out. I rewatched it several times. And uh, I, I've never been a huge fan of it, but it always has a certain charm to it that I like to rewatch it from time to time. And it's just interesting to watch someone, uh, watch a movie like this that kind of came out right before Vin, Vin Diesel kind of really exploded in fame and stuff like that. And then he's continued to try and make movies out of it. So it kind of, it's an interesting kind of film in film history as Vin Diesel's become Vin Diesel since that one came out. Next up, Pirates of the Caribbean. The first one's just great. Uh, just a fun adventure film that was such a surprise when it came out. I mean, we every, everyone was ripping on it like, why on earth are you making a movie out of a ride? Because they had a great idea for it. And this is the movie that pushed kind of uh, uh, Johnny Depp to the A-list. He'd been around a long time. Uh, or he'd been around for 20 years because he was in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street in 1984. So almost 19 years in the industry and in kind of big budget movies. But he hadn't become that A-list blockbuster. Everyone knows who he is. He was just like a respected actor that had been a bunch of stuff. And then he did this, and he's become the Johnny Depp that kind of, of mainstream, popular, A-list, makes tons of money type guy. Um, this is the starting point for it. And when you watch the movie, it's it's pretty easy to see why, because of how fun, charming, pleasant all of it was. Then a movie that we haven't seen on this list yet, Pitch Perfect. Hey, wait a minute. Didn't we just talk about this? Yes, we own two copies of Pitch Perfect. That's, I mean, sometimes you just have to have two discs so that they're running in two different rooms. That's how often that movie gets played in my house. Then we got Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Classic, classic Thanksgiving holiday movie. You don't have a lot of Thanksgiving holiday movies. There's one right there, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. This is a really cool movie. Um, very funny uh, the humor's not necessarily modern day sense of humor, but it still works. It's not like sometimes you watch older comedies and the comedy doesn't work anymore. This one, when I say the comedy's different, it's much more the pacing of the comedy. It's not necessarily the joke, the joke, the joke type of thing. And also, it just has a lot more has a certain level of heart to it and depth of emotion that's a little bit surprising um, for the, what the movie is. But it's not actually surprising because it's John Hughes. From there, we move along to Predators. I've been meaning to rewatch this one for a while. So I, I never had any issues with the movie Predators. It's a it's a movie that um, a lot of people, I guess, have been kind of negative on because of the Lawrence Fishburne kind of plot line kind of so uh, spoils it for a few people. I, I just always kind of thoroughly enjoyed it, and I thought it worked for what it is, and it's a very fine, wait, digital copy. Wait a minute, I'm going to put this one off to the side because I need to redeem my digital copy of this, which has probably expired by now. The things that you learn while shooting videos. I, I have no problems with that movie. I enjoy it well enough. A very nice addition to the Predator series. Because not every movie has to be as good as the original or mind-blowing. It just needs to be a worthy addition that provides something new. The idea of going to their planet... Uh, and there's many of them. That's an interesting idea, so I'm fine with that movie. Then we got Pride and Prejudice, the one with Keira Knightley from like 10 years ago. You know, Keira Knightley does, does an enormous number of these period piece movies where she dresses up in costumes and does very British type things that my wife loves that... Not me. I don't watch that one. Then we got Primal Fear. The movie that really kind of put Edward Norton on the map is kind of this powerhouse actor. Um, another movie with kind of twist in it. Did he, did, it, did he do it? Did he not do it? All that fun stuff and the questions to it. I don't remember it a whole real well. I need to rewatch it one of these days. Not enough that I'm going to put it on the stack, 
but enough that maybe one of these days I will rewatch this one to see how much I still care for it. Then we got the Princess Bride. Everyone loves the Princess Bride. You gotta own a copy of the Princess Bride if you, well if you're if you're normal, um, and I'm very normal and boring. So I of course own a copy of it. Seen it like a bazillion times, like everybody else. So pleasant and charming. This is actually a movie that I, I've been meaning to do a video on it because in certain ways I think that this movie shouldn't work. And there's all these reasons that it's kind of really bad, but it's not. It's a really good, well-made movie, while in another sense seeming to be really bad. I have a, a video idea from it that I, I came up with like a year ago, and I need to I need to make that video about that one. Next up, we'll just pull these ones together. A couple of different Punisher movies. Uh, I'm, Punisher's just a fun character because I like violent action hero type guys, so a comic book version of that works for me. So I'm very fond of the Thomas Jane one personally because I like Thomas Jane as an actor. And there's some things. This one's based off a somewhat based off a comic book called Welcome Back, Frank. There's some scenes directly from it. Um, so there's a, and I have a video. There's a video game version of it that's really cool. It's based off. Well, it's actually not based off the the movie. It's based off of Welcome Back, Frank, the graphic novel. But Thomas Jane does the voices in it, and so it, it's actually pretty cool. So I have all sorts of fond memories of this one. I don't have any of the hate and criticism some people have for it. Punisher War Zone is um, it's an interesting one because it didn't. I didn't. I missed it in the theaters. It was, it was originally going to be a sequel to this one, and then it turned into its own standalone thing. It has a totally different tone. It's much more cartoonish, but cartoonish in that it's really violent. So it's a very interesting movie that exists. That uh, I, I need to watch it again, and because it seems like as time has passed. It's, its reputation's gotten better and the right people talk about it as opposed to the wrong people and stuff like that. I don't even know what that means, what I just said. Next up, we got the movie Push. It's like a superhero movie that's not actually based on any comic books. So it's kind of interesting in that regard. But the actual execution is a little bit ho-hum. There's just not a lot of super memorable about it besides the cast and like, oh, Chris Evans in a comic book movie that's not a comic book. So that's interesting. But the movie itself, like I said, it's... It's not very memorable beyond the basic idea of it. What I remember about it is really just the trailer and the images from the trailer. Next up, another sticky one. I spilled all sorts of stuff on my Blu-rays, apparently. Quantum of Solace, the generally believed to be the worst of the Daniel Craig James Bond movies. I don't think it's the worst. I didn't. I just watched Spectre for the first time like a week ago. I didn't care for that one. But um, yeah, it's pretty forgettable. And it's sticky, so I don't want to hold it any longer. Next up is all four of the Rambo movies. I don't. I have a metal. I have an actual metal tin set for the uh, the original trilogy, and I don't know why it's not here, but I own it. So if you're counting the movies, there are three additional Rambo movies that go along with, with this one. I love the Rambo movies because I love Stallone. It's a weird series because the first one's like pretty well a serious drama, and then by the time you get to the last or third, or second one, <laughs> as soon as you get to this take on, this is ridiculous Stallone '80s obnoxious, over the top awesomeness, and then the fourth one is just insanely violent. So make it that what you will. The special features on them aren't very good. I, I, there might be a version out there that has good special features. The ones that I have don't have good special features. Then we got Rain Man. Back when Tom Cruise was trying to be a serious actor and was a serious actor and should be a serious actor. I don't know. He, it, I don't know. It's like he decided he wanted to try and be 40 years old for a large amount of his life. And so he just kept making action movies. The guy needs to get back to dramas. He's actually a good actor. So next up, we've got Rat Race, a movie that my wife's really into that's silly. So we own it. And I've seen it many more times than I'd like to admit. Then, coming up, that Christian Bale dragon movie with Matthew McConaughey I was forgetting the title of. It's called Reign of Fire. It's from Rob Bowman. Uh, he's the guy that directed Electra back two hours ago in this video. <laughs> this video is so long. Or there's several different videos in this series, depending on which way I'm doing it. This, I'm doing all of this in one sitting, so... Whew. But yeah, it's a... It, it's, it's a... Interesting concept that's kind of a mediocre movie. It's not as good as you want it to be. It's not as bad. Some people have said it's horrible. It's not. It's just kind of like right there in that middle spot of movies. Of If you like dragon movies or you like the actors, it's worth seeing, but it's not much better. Interesting enough, another Christian Bale movie. This one I've never seen. Um, it kind of came out when he was like on that up and kind of on that Batman Begins Dark Knight window where he's first kind of exploding into the A-list. was like, oh, a serious drama with him. I'll check that out. And it's from Vernon Herzog, which means more to me now than it did before. And I just never ended up watching it. Like, I've owned it 10 years. I've just never watched it. Seeing him, um, you know, losing weight because he's starving and as a POW, 
just just not super uh, sound appealing to me. Then we got one, a movie called The Ringer that um, Johnny Knoxville comedy and where he pretends to be mentally handicapped. Fairly offensive movie in certain regards. Some people just hate it on pure concept because it, it feels like it's making fun of mentally handicapped people. It's not really. That's not really what the movie's doing. It's much more of a fun love letter type thing. But the execution, the way it plays out, things, it's very easy for it to be perceived of really poorly. So it's one we own that I think my wife really liked, actually, that I haven't particularly watched all that many times. Isn't Catherine Heigl in it? Yeah, I think uh, Catherine Heigl's the girl in it, so then that one also made me go, I don't think I want to keep rewatching them. Then we got Road to Perdition, Sam Mendes' follow-up to um, uh, American Beauty, which was really cool, one of those movies that, as, as I was hitting like 18, adult, actual life, where I can appreciate movies that were serious. So that was one of the first ones I was like, wow, I'm a sophisticated adult that likes American Beauty. Then I found out he was following it up with a violent period piece gangster movie, with Tom Hanks and based off a graphic novel I haven't read. Um, so this one, I, I need to rewatch this one again. It's a very cool little movie um, that just seeing Tom Hanks in a very different type of role that we have you haven't seen him in before. So if you haven't seen this one, I'd encourage you to check it out. It's from Sam Mendes, who did the last two James Bond movies. So it's and it came after he did American Beauty, which is so not a James Bond movie. This is in its own way kind of that middle point between those two things. Then a movie, two copies of it that I love that I've seen so many times, saw it in the theaters, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Um, so this is the first place that I ever saw Alan Rickman and um, the sheriff of, sheriff of Nottingham. This first place I saw Morgan Freeman. So many, a couple different key big firsts this movie. But it's it's a... I, I've never... I, I, just because I saw it at the age that I saw it and how many times I've watched it at that time, how much I loved it. Um, I've never understood the criticisms just because I'm so locked in on, it's amazing, it's my childhood. But Kevin Costner's accent and some things. But for me, this is the definitive telling a Robin Hood in the cinematic format. And there's some amazing versions of it. Like this version right here has all kinds of special features. This Blu-ray, not so much. You look at the cover, they look similar. Actual list of special features, quite different. So be careful. Get the awesome thing, not the less than awesome thing. Pretty sure this is my sister's and this is mine. So, sister, if you're watching this, sorry I stole your better stuff. Next, we've got RoboCop. I love RoboCop. I'm a big, those Paul Verhoeven violent movies that came out there for a few years. Huge fan of all of them. Um, social commentary, satire, all sorts of stuff woven into one while being this cool, violent action movie. There's some versions that have some great special features, so be sure to get a good copy of it. Don't get one of the versions that's crappy and cheap. Get a good, hearty one where you learn about all the violence. Then we've got Robots, a movie I've never seen that I don't know where we got it from, but apparently it's got a pretty great cast of voice actors. That's all. Then we've got one Rocky movie, even though if you if you got it, if you're counting... And I've got all seven of them. So I'm only the only one. I do have all seven. This is a killer version um, of the movie that has like a, there's all a little booklet thing right here. S tons of special features, commentary, Stallone kind of given all the details about it. And then there's other versions. I've got, I've got like three of the sets of the Rocky movies and, um, a lot of them have no special features. A lot of the movies that, like, two, three, four, and five, there's no special features. I need to find one. I'd, I'd love to hear Stallone's take on some of those movies and kind of where things went. But for Rocky One, Rocky Balboa, and Creed, there's some killer special features. Make sure you get those ones. But as I said, I've got all of them. Just for some reason, I've only got this one copy of um, Rocky available to me in this uh, video right now. Next up, we've got Role Models. I think I've only seen it one time. I was in the mood for, you know, a comedy, and it was on sale at Blockbuster, as, once again, a common theme in all of this, so I picked it up. I think I only watched it the one time. It's pleasant enough. Next up, an interesting pairing of movies, uh, Romancing the Stone and Jewel of the Nile. Romancing the Stone is a really fun... It's kind of like... It's, in many ways, kind of like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark pretty intentionally, except it's based off romance novels. And so it's kind of like if you did a uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark type of story and adventure, except from a female perspective. 
So you have the adventure, you have the adventure, exciting stuff in it, but it's very much kind of this romantic, like a romance novel version of it with Michael Douglas, Kathleen Turner, D- Danny DeVito's in there. And it's directed by Robert Zemeckis. This is the reason he was able to do Back to the Future because he'd been like the struggling director that hadn't had a hit. Then he did this one and it was a big hit. If, if you hadn't seen this one, I'd encourage you to check it out. It's a little bit dated. It doesn't age as well as um, the, the Indiana Jones movies, but still a, a ton of fun, and especially seeing Michael Douglas in a different type of role. Then they did a sequel to it that, I mean, just a couple years later, went kind of went straight for it, and it, it's just not as good. Robert Zemeckis didn't come back. It's just a very forgettable movie. Um, so a very disappointing sequel, kind of a classic bad sequel is what it is. Um, so I, 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 like my wife always like, hey, we should watch Romancing the Stone. She's never seen Jewel of the Nile, I don't think. I, she, it's not even open, so... Actually, I'll take these ones. She always wants to watch those ones, so maybe we'll have a romantic double feature tonight um, with that movie she's never seen that I just said was really bad. Um, Then we got Romeo Must Die. It was right around when uh, uh, Jet Li was transitioning over to the U.S. So a martial arts take on Romeo and Juliet. Um, Not my favorite of his movies or his American movies or anything like that, but I own it. It's, It's passable enough entertainment. So... Do what you want with that. Next up, probably my favorite of the Wes Anderson movies, The Royal Tenenbaums. This is a killer um, set right now. Uh, Fun fun special features, fun packaging, all sorts of stuff, talking about the insane mind that is um, Wes Anderson's. So I saw this one in the theaters right at that point in time where I was getting all pretentious and seeing movies that other people weren't seeing in theaters. And so it has a special place in my heart from a period of time in my life and a pretentious phase. But it's a very enjoyable film and t- touches on actual human emotion type things while being wacky, quirky Wes Anderson stuff. Then we got Rudy. Well, everyone else seems to like Rudy more than I do. I've never been a big Rudy fan. I enjoyed it enough. It's interesting enough, but it's not one that I rewatch myself a whole lot. Uh, I do own it. I've watched it a few times, but I've only watched it a few times. So there you go. Then one that we own and we've never seen. My wife tried to get me to watch it a whole bunch of times back when we first, I guess for like two years, she was trying to get me to watch this movie and I just never watched it. I was just never in the movie to watch a movie called Run, Fat Boy, Run, starring Simon Pegg and div- directed by David Schwimmer of Friends fame. It's also written by Michael Ian Black, so that's kind of interesting. I need to watch this one one of these days uh, just to figure out if if I like actually love it and was like, why am I depriving myself of fun and humor all these years? Or if it's just as forgettable as I think it's going to be. Next up, a movie based off of the writings of Richard Bachman, also known as <laughs> Stephen King. So it's, it's just an interesting film in and of itself that it's a um, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that's based off the writings of Stephen King, but Stephen King writing under a pseudonym. It's interesting. And it's also interesting because it's a movie that was kind of very much ahead of its time in that it's like based on reality TV, the escalation of that type of things, using television as a means to control the population, all sorts of ideas that are kind of in the Hunger Games a lot in later things. But here it was 30 years ago, very violent movie, um, I guess, well, I guess the coverage time it takes place in 2019, so I know what's going to be happening in the next couple of years in culture, but uh, if you haven't seen this one, you got to check this one out. It's Especially now that it's come out, and all we want to do is see adaptations of Ski- Stephen King works, that's one you got to see. Next up, Rush Hour 2. Um, I was a huge Jackie Chan fan back in the day, so I, whenever Rush Hour was a big hit, I was more excited than anyone um, on planet Earth, except for all the people more excited than me. For example, these two guys. But so huge fan when that happened. Brett Ratner directed movie, going to that common theme of Brett Ratner, Brett Ratner just directing totally random things. But... Um, but so yeah, fun movie. Second one also very fun movie, generic of sorts. They're just kind of buddy cop movies with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker's certain charms to them. I never saw the third one, and everything I've heard indicates that I made a wise choice in not seeing that one. Next up, we've got Sabrina. I've actually only seen this a couple of times. I remember loving it back when I saw it when it first came out in the theater, and just kind of Harrison Ford in a romantic comedy, which that's a fun sort of idea to see something like that. But then, um, yeah, I haven't haven't watched it since then. So I I I think I've watched it one time since then when we bought it. But every time I watch it, I'm like, that's delightful. I need to watch that more often. But I haven't actually done that. Then we've got The Saint. 
a Val Kilmer, Elizabeth Shue movie. Not really a superhero story, but he's kind of a hero type character while not really Simon Templar. It's based off a, a TV show from the 60s starring um, Bond number three um, um, uh, died a couple months ago. Why am I blanking on his name? That's embarrassing. I'm sorry. The one that was the 70s and early 80s one. I that actually, I talked about all these movies. That's why I'm blanking on really obvious things that I would never, ever forget otherwise. But uh, enjoyable enough film. Not great. Just good. Every time I watch it, I'm like, that was good. I can wait a while before I watch it again. But it's always been enjoyable enough for me. And I, I still can't remember his name. That's It's killing me. Live and let die. I don't Awful. The Santa Claus movie. I didn't see. In the, I didn't see any of these in the theater. I, I don't. I think I started watching them after I got married. My wife said, "You haven't seen the Santa Claus movies?" No, I haven't seen the Santa Claus movies. So then we started watching some of the Santa Claus movies, and they're Tim Allen Christmas family comedies. Now I have kids, so they're a little bit more fun to watch. They're more pleasant than some of the other stuff that we might watch during Christmas season. So, but not my thing. But a thing that other people like. Next up, Scream 2. Not Scream 1, my favorite horror movie, but Scream 2, a very good uh, horror movie that I enjoy thoroughly. Uh, yeah, for me, this is kind of the, def this is my favorite slasher film franchise. The one I watch the most kind of came out of that phase in life, like The Faculty. So I, I've, you know, seen these movies a ton of times. I thoroughly enjoy all, all those movies. Next up, Seabiscuit. Never seen it. I own it. Never seen it. Don't know where it came from. Don't know why I bought it. Or maybe my wife bought it. Don't know. I own it, though, so if ever I'm in the mood to watch Tobey Maguire ride a horse, now I can. Then we've got Seven. Seven, a movie that you can tell how expensive DVDs and Blu-rays used to be. I bought this 15 years ago, used, and used it was still $19. But then again, it's very cool packaging for what this one is on the inside. Great special features. All of it. Very, very cool stuff. And a movie I almost never rewatch. So even when we got robbed, this one I guess didn't get stolen, so I still had it. I've had this forever, and it's just so dark, depressing in that ending. <laughs> I'm really in the mood to watch this one, especially now that I have kids. Um, and even some of the discussion and the plot stuff in the movie with where it goes, you're going... I make a mistake having kids. Well, this movie will convince you that you did. But once again, I, obviously very good movie. David Fincher, shocking twist ending, and amazing special features if you get the right version. I don't know if there's bad versions of it because I've always had that version. Then one very cool packaging for a movie that not enough people went to go see, Joss Whedon's first film, Serenity. So I didn't catch Firefly when it was on TV, but my sister and brother-in-law, they had the box set for it, and I was watching Buffy and Angel and all that, and they're like, oh, you got to check out this one he just did. No one's, like, no one watched it. It got canceled. It's amazing. So I was a part of that next wave of fans of Firefly that checked it out in that phase. So by the time they made Serenity, I was one of those people so pumped about it. It was their opening weekend, trying to make it make money. I did my part. I told a bunch of people at the Bible college I was at, and actually it was a big hit at the my Bible college. A bunch of people went to go see it. Still didn't make a ton of money, so Joss Whedon didn't take off for several years after that. But there's several cool different collector's edition releases of it. Here's one of them. I don't know why the case is so big, but it's, it looks cool. Um, there's an extended edition. There's several different versions of it with some great special features. Um, there you go. Next up, 17 again. You know, for all you big Zach Braff fans, they're also big fans of uh, Matthew Perry. There, you've got this movie in existence um, I bought it kind of, it was like a, you know, few dollars at Best Buy or something like that. And we needed something to watch that night. So I bought it. It was charming enough. I've never rewatched it. I need to rewatch it again now that Zac Efron's kind of stopped being high school musical guy and he's become raunchy comedy guy. And he needs to transition out of the raunchy comedy. I don't know what he, he's pigeonholing himself into a really weird place, but I've got no issues with, uh, um, uh, Zac Efron. Did I, I might, that might've said Zac Braff a minute ago. I've also might be losing my mind, um, from talking about too many movies for way too long. But yeah, pleasant enough little movie and the whole cast has got Michelle Trashton, Trashtenberg in there too and some other... Is that Leslie Mann is in there? Hey, looks like Leslie Mann's in it too. That's fun. Then, Shaft. 
So classic black exploitation film from the 70s. I haven't watched it in a little bit, but I remember liking it back in the day. Just kind of, kind of cool, fun movie. Sometimes I get in the mood for 70s action like Death Wish, and then other times I get in the mood for Shaft. So got this one. Uh, it's been too long since I've watched it, so I don't want to say too much about it. I just have fond memories of when I did watch it. And, of course, the amazing theme song, Shaft, from it. Um, next up, we got a pair of Shanghai movies with uh, Jackie Chan and Owen Wilson while Jackie Ch- or while Jackie Chan had already had Rush Hour, so he'd kind of made it in the U.S. and was kind of writing on his peak of U.S. fame. Owen Wilson was on the rise up. Pair them together, and you got, a, well, one really... One really cool movie and one movie that I wasn't so crazy about. Wasn't that Kurtzman work on this one? I'm having fake memories. No, this one was worked on by the guys that did Small uh, Smallville. Alfred Goh and Miles Miller worked on this one while they were working on Smallville. That's what I was remembering. Um, maybe they worked on both of them. Yeah, they worked on both of them. Just things you learn while I read boxes in front of you. But so that would explain also why I might have liked them. I was a big Smallville uh, fan. So there you go. Fun ones worth checking out a little bit. Then we've got Stranger Than Fiction from Mark Forster, who did Quantum of Solace. And um, my wife really likes this one. I don't even know. I don't even think I've seen it. I've kind of seen it. It's an interesting concept for a movie that I didn't pay attention to. So there you go. All right, we're moving into the final stretch. Now two thirds of the stuff behind me is gone, though some of it's still right here. This next section right here should go pretty quickly because I got Star Trek and Star Wars in there so I could talk about those in big chunks. Oh, here we go. Now we got She's the Man, a movie that I've seen way, way, way too many times, primarily because I worked for teenagers for a long time. And apparently teenage girls that were born in the mid 90s love, 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 love this movie. So they can quote through it like people you never would have guessed they would even cared about this movie. Know every single word to it. Uh, it blew my mind um, what you learn about teenagers when you work with them. Then we got Sherlock Holmes. I never actually liked these very much. Um, not compared to most people that seem to have a greater fondness. They're directed by Guy Ritchie, and I really liked Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. It got stolen from me. And Snatch, it got stolen from me. Uh, that's why they're not in this collection of movies. But I really liked those movies a ton. Robert Downey Jr., at this point in time, I loved him. Seemed like, oh, this could be an interesting, great combination. And then it, it's not. I Guy Ritchie's style, I feel like, fits to Guy Ritchie crime story specific to him. I don't think it fits King Arthur and stuff like that. It's kind of proven it doesn't tend to lend itself well to a lot of other stuff, but I own it. Next up, Short Circuit, a movie from my childhood that I used to watch on TV all the time, and it hasn't necessarily aged great. It does have Dr. Pepper in it, so that's pretty exciting, but, you know, fun, exciting robot guy talking. This has no special features. That's disappointing that, you know, maybe it would be interesting to hear how they brought this robot to life. There's a second one that's just as good as the first one. I actually remember the second one a lot more because it gets kind of mean and nasty in the third act to it. And I remember that being traumatized to me as a kid. But then he, like, goes out kind of for revenge and stuff in a comedic fashion. And so I remember that stuff more than that one. Next up... Showdown in Little Tokyo. It's a fun piece of film history because it's Dolph Lundgren with Brandon Lee. So Brandon Lee, uh, the pop culture mainstream discussion about him really only talks about The Crow and because he was killed during the making of it. People talk about Brandon Lee uh, quite a bit because of just this one movie, but he did several kind of martial arts movies before that, martial arts action movies, and they're, they're pretty good. His fight style and choreography uh, was quite good. He was bringing in a lot of the Asian type stuff before other people had done so. If you were paying attention, I do believe a booger just came out of my nose while I was talking. I'm going to leave that in the video because uh, I just need to finish this thing. But it's directed by Mark Lester, who I, I believe that's the guy that did Bloodsport. So he did a lot of these kind of martial arts movies back in that point in time. So it's just a fun piece of history. It's also got Tia Carrera from... Wayne's World and True Lies in it, so a bunch of fun little things about that one. Then we got Signs. I, a lot of people don't like Signs because of the third act stuff. I No problems for me. Um, maybe he was trying a little bit too hard. Maybe you stretch a little. I, that doesn't, never bothered me. The movie works for what it's trying to be uh, on the levels it's supposed to work, it does. Um, in my sense of nitpicking movies, isn't bothered by that type of issue or um, plot hole. So I, on kind of every level, I thought it was kind of just had a fun humor to it that hadn't been in the previous movies. And then just uh, kind of the spooky side to it worked. And then just the faith tied all in all, I liked it. Hey, it looks like we're in a little M night, little, um, run here. Then we got 
The Sixth Sense. A, of course, a famous classic, and probably the most famous of the M. Night films, one of the most famous plot twists in human history, of human history, in film history, in this one. All in all, a very solid movie that really, you need to watch it two times, especially if you didn't figure it out or hadn't had it spoiled for you. You watch it the first time, and it works on one level, and you walk it, watch it the second time, and it works on a totally different set of levels. But this is one of those movies that you watch it, and you go, this guy is so talented. How is he so bad for what, 12 years there that he was just just awful with the movies that he was making. And once again, you also watch it and you go, Bruce Willis, what are you doing? Like, what are, what's all this crap that you're making? You're so much better than all of this. And then uh, this is a very nice edition of it that um, multiple, I think, three discs in there. Nice packaging, some cool special features. So there's some very nice versions of it. If you like this movie, track down a... I promise I know how things work. Sorry for the delay. There's some really nice versions of it out there if uh, you're looking. So like com contrasting, this is just like pfft, some throwaway thing that like, hey, we got a commentary on there. This is like nice packaging, multiple discs, multiple featurettes and stuff. So get the good stuff. Then we've got the Skulls. One and two. So apparently there's a second Skulls movie and I own it. Uh, looking at the cast, nobody that you've ever heard of. So, I don't know, just kind of one of these thriller-type movies from 20 years ago. Uh, Paul Walker, Joshua Jackson in it. So some of those people that were in a lot of movies like this at that time in the first one. And then the second one has no one you've ever heard of. Pretty forgettable movie. No reason to track it down. Who did direct it? Is the first one directed by someone? Yeah, Rob Cohen directed the first one. So he's the guy that did uh, the first Fast and the Furious movie. He did the first Triple X movie. He did Brandon the... Uh, Brandon. Dragon the Bruce Lee story. But all in all, um, pretty forgettable. Then we got Skyfall, one of the celebrated and the financially the most successful James Bond movie. Um, so I really thoroughly enjoy it. J uh, Daniel Craig's my favorite James Bond. Oh, digital copy. I don't better save that one also to make sure that I get my code for that one. I don't think that's loaded up in my list of stuff. But a very solid, enjoyable film. This version doesn't have very many good special features, so it's probably a better one that has like a retrospective. So don't get that crappy version of it. Next up, Sleepless in Seattle, 10th anniversary edition, which is kind of funny because now this 10th anniversary is over 10 years old as the movie is that old. But um, yeah, I mean... Another one of those movies that kind of just solidified Tom Hanks as this guy that can do be a romantic lead as well. Did uh, some other things with Meg Ryan throughout the years, and so this one was the most iconic of their collaborations together. Solid little, cute little, charming, romantic film that if you're a lady and are familiar with lady type movies, um, there's several references in it that um, are far more meaningful than they are for me. There's also a Dirty Dozen reference in it. So maybe I watched this one time with my wife and then we followed up with the Dirty Dozen. So that was kind of fun. Um, that joke in that movie paid off for me to get to watch that movie. And, uh, whoa. What's wrong with that? What's going on there? So that's not attached. Then we've got The Social Network, another David Fincher film. Very solid movie about Facebook. Very, very interesting. The thing that people most talk about this movie, though, is um, Army Hammer playing twins and Andrew Garfield's performance being quite good in it, which is interesting because it's like obviously a really good movie and it had all sorts of award buzz and types of things like that. And then people talk about these other two actors that weren't kind of the big shining stars of it, that just kind of their performances popped. That's at least what I remember when I watched it was, oh, who's this guy? Who are these twins? Wait, it's one guy. That's awesome. And now he's Army Hammer, the guy that Hollywood's been trying to make part of the A-list for a while. And he's really good. He should be a part of the A-list. Next up, Soldier, a Kurt Russell, random kind of throwaway action movie from Paul Anderson, the crappy one, not the good one, uh, from 20 years ago. Now, here's the thing that makes this one kind of interesting, is that the director put a bunch of Easter eggs in this movie because it deals with robot people to imply and give it ties to Blade Runner. So... In his mind, this is a spin-off of Blade Runner. And it's been talked about. It's not just conjecture. There's actual ties to Blade Runner in this movie. And that's the most interesting thing about it. Actually, not, this is like one of the two most interesting things. The other interesting thing about it is that Kurt Russell's character has almost no dialogue in the movie. And he was paid a pretty good paycheck. But he only says like 100 words. And so I think, don't quote me on this, I think he it's one of the movies where... Uh, there's some interesting statistic about how much he was paid for per word of dialogue that he said. And he's one of the most highest paid per word actors of all time for this movie. That's 
actually very forgettable and not very good. Next up, a movie I saw for the first time only a month or two ago, Space Jam. I mean, I know it was a classic, but by the time it came out, I was old enough that I'm like, I'm not going to watch a Looney Tunes movie with Michael Jordan. I'm not stupid. And then it turns out everyone else did, just not me. I skipped out on what this classic. Um, so anyway, Space Jam, it's it's one of those movies that the concept of it is more fascinating than the movie itself. The movie itself is like, it's just a novelty. Beyond the novelty, it's not particularly entertaining. Then that leads us to Speed, one of the first rated R movies I saw in the theater. And why that's pretty great first rated R movie or one of your first rated R movies to see in the theater because it's a really good movie. Um, age is very well, very solid, entertaining action thriller, the right type of movie for Keanu Reeves, the right type of role for Sandra Bullock, all in all, I, I mean, I have no criticisms really of the, maybe the third act goes on a little bit too long. There's a little bit too much in there. Oh, just a really great kind of movie. Um, so check this one out. It's, if you haven't seen Speed, why did you watch this four hour long collection of my DVDs and Blu-rays and not watch Speed instead? Then we've got three Spider-Man movies, two copies of Spider-Man 2 in there, and then one copy of Spider-Man 1. I Actually, I do own it. I stole Nathan Albers' copy of Spider-Man 3 by accident. He's done a couple of reviews on me on here, but a year ago. I don't think he's done with me in a year. But So anyway, the Raimi Spider-Man movies, obviously iconic and important in the time period when they came out in the history of comic book movies and kind of taking them to a different level with being able to use CGI and special effects. They're kind of one of the ones along with X-Men that took us into this modern era of movies that now kind of dominate the box office. And they're, they're in a certain way, is very dated, in a certain ways kind of timeless because of the way they're directed. Certain ways they've aged really well, in certain ways they seem like they've aged pretty poorly. Some of that just kind of depends on your take on how you watch them. And so I watch them and I think, these age really well because of Sam Raimi's quirky direction. They just kind of puts them in this unique place. In other place, people watch them and be like, they've aged so poorly because of this, this, and this, and this. And they list off the same exact things that I make think make them timeless and other people think, I mean, they've aged really poorly. But, uh, you know, I... I think the first two of age are quite good and aged really well. And we've got Spirit. I don't know what it is. I've never seen it. I've owned it for a while. Maybe my wife's watched it. I don't know. Maybe someone gave it to us, but cool. I own Spirit. Then I've got own Stand By Me, a movie I have never seen, um, which I think it's like Cody Leach's favorite movie or something like that, and I've never seen it. So I'll definitely put this one on the stack. I need to watch that one. I think I actually told one of my patrons I'm just going to watch this one this this month. So... Put that one on the stack to watch and review this month. Then, got a big old stack of Star Trek movies. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't have all of them. I have almost all of them. Some of them aren't right here. Some of them are loaned out. Some of, I Like the first Star Trek, JJ, one I have on um, uh, a digital but anyway, yeah, there we are. And here's the deal about these ones. Obviously, I'm a big Star Trek fan, love Star Trek, so I have a whole bunch of these. But here's the deal. They did these um, special editions of, for them, director's editions on DVD, uh, wow, almost 15 years ago now. Incredible special features, like Star Trek Wrath, Wrath of Khan, Star Trek III, um, amazing special features with new interviews with everybody, kind of in-depth looking at stuff, deleted scenes, where they came about, interviews with the producers, with the director, kind of everyone that they could interview, they did. And so, I mean, this this Star Trek II has some of my favorite special features of any movie of all, all time. So I, I, I don't even have the Blu-rays. I don't know if they transferred over all those special features or not, but I need to get the, obviously, my favorite one on Blu-ray. My favorite one, and then I threw it. Rage issues. So, um, yeah, I need to... Track. I need to get the Blu-ray for that one. I just hope it has a really nice version of those special features. Then we've got Stargate. Uh, following a Kurt Russell trend recently. Um, so I never really watched the TV show. So Stargate, when I think about it, I think about this movie, which I saw in the theaters that I enjoyed a good bit at the time. It's a Roland Emmerich film, which it seems awfully small scale because most of his movies, the world ends in them. Um, but so kind of early Roland Emmerich along with Universal Soldier. I enjoy it. It's a fun little film. A little bit over long. It gets a little bit messy at times, but solid film in, from my perspective. From there, we'll move on to this little series called... Actually, that, that didn't work at all. Called Star Wars. And I also have more discs of these somewhere. 
different versions of them. So there's my official anthology or complete saga for the first two trilogies. Um, this is kind of a pretty definitive Blu-ray collection of them for the if, since they're not going to put the original versions on there. This one has tons of special features, tons of all the stuff you want behind the scenes. So many deleted scenes from the original trilogy. This is kind of the definitive kind of one. Mine's kind of worn out. I don't know what kind of happened to it, um, but very cool set right here. Then just got one of the different versions. I think they released a bunch of different versions of uh, um, the Force Awakens, but. A bunch of them had pretty cool special features on it. It's one of those ones that the special features of 10 years from now, I think will be a lot better. Then it can speak a lot more openly about the making process of it. That's what I want to see, like the Michael Art stuff. What debates were they happening behind the scenes? They can't really tell us that stuff right now. But the ones that are actually a little bit more interesting is that I have the DVD set that has the um, original they, at one point in time, very briefly did release a version that has the original cuts of the movies, not special edition. So I do have those and you can see disc number two. I, I don't know it goes out. Of, I don't have autofocus on, but as the original theatrical cuts of those. So those are pretty cool because people always say like they never released them. They did. They haven't released them on Blu-ray yet, but they're what they did put them out on DVD for a short period of time. So Star Wars. I've got some Star Wars movies. Next up in the realm of stars, Starship Troopers Marauder. So the only one I appear to own is the third one. It's unopened. Um, it was on streaming for a while. That's one of those reasons. But um, so the first one is a very cool Paul Verhoeven movie. The second one is like, feels like they, it's not even a Starship Troopers movie. It feels like it's a, like they were going to make a different movie and they just decided to put Starship Troopers on it because they thought more people would watch it. That's probably true and what happened with that one. And the third one is actually a Starship Troopers movie that's a sequel to the original one. Um with Casper Van Dien returning as Rico and all sorts of stuff. Not as good, not as ambitious, much smaller budget, but for a straight to video movie, it actually had a pretty big budget for it. And it was, um, it was directed by the guy that wrote the first one, as well as the guy that wrote RoboCop. So uh, a lot of return to form of the satire and things in it. Smaller scale, not as good, of course, but still a solid movie that I need to rewatch re one of these days. Oh, and this girl right here is the, was the Vulcan chick on um, Star Trek Enterprise. Fun fact! Then we got Step Brothers, one of my favorite Will Ferrell movies. Just a fun, quirky, weird, raunchy, dirty, heartfelt, all those sorts of things that you found in those Adam McKay ones. There, it's in this one. Those two guys have great chemistry. All around, just great chemistry from everybody. Lots of funny people crammed into it with a funny script, a funny setup, which makes for a very funny movie. Moving along. Woo! Four different movies. So if you're keeping track of the movies, we got four of them right here. Four Steven Seagal movies. This one's pretty crappy, but I have nostalgic memories for it. This one's actually pretty good. It's from the same director as this one, and this one's his best movie, and this one is kind of a forgettable thing within one of the Ivor... Uh, Ivory Wayne's, Wayne's brothers. Um, I was trying to remember, is Ke Ivory is his name, Keenan Ivory Wayne's. It's like, Ivory Wayne's, that's not right. Um, Damon Wayne's is brother. But that's just a really good movie. If you haven't seen that one, that's actually a good action thriller from the director of The Fugitive. This one's another good, not as good, but another good action, solid movie from the director of The Fugitive. And then this one is a, just a pretty crappy movie where Steven Seagal started getting political and they let him get political. I just never cared all that much for The Glimmer Man. Next up, we've got two copies of... The 70s movie, The Street Fighter, starring Sonny Chiba. This one's actually a, a collection of the first one and the second one. Um, they're really, really <laughs> absurdly violent martial arts movies from the 70s when Japan wanted a response to Bruce Lee. They gave us Sonny Chiba, and it's not like ripping off Bruce Lee. He's his own style of crazy insanity, his own different thing. Um, very Pretty cool, enjoyable little film. Next up, another Jack Ryan movie. This time we've got Ben Affleck as Jack Ryan. Um, I, I like this one enough. It came out at the wrong time because people were starting to sour on Ben Affleck, but it's actually a, a pretty decent movie. Solid, not great, not amazing, not the best of the bunch, but I, I find it more memorable than uh, Hunt for the Red October and Patriot Games, as well as, well as Jack Ryan, the movie Jack Ryan. So I guess that's would maybe it's my second favorite of the bunch, so I, I like it. Then, ugh, 
the Superman box set. This is Superman the movie through Superman Returns. And this is, I've, I got two copies of this one actually. This is the Blu-ray set. I also have the DVD set. But it's it's a th very thorough. This is, if you love Superman movies, this is the thing to get. Uh, you got, there's like four discs on Superman the movie. There's three discs for Superman 2 because you have both the theatrical cut and Richard Donner cut. There's not as much as stuff. There's like a deluxe edition of Superman 3 and deluxe edition of Superman 4, but there's not like a bunch of, and there's like deleted scenes. There's not as much cool stuff as you want, but even has like a, a comic book. And there's this, once kind of talking about, you can figure out what type of special features I like, but there's a, a full document, full length documentary on the making of all the South kind Superman stuff. So Superman, the motion picture through Superman four and how it got sold a whole making of all of that stuff and talks about Supergirl in there and how confused everyone else was as to whether it was part of the Christopher Reeve one or not. Um, so all in all, if you like Superman movies, get this set. This is, there's, it's a, it's a good one. And difficult to put back in the box. Then another weird one that my wife is really into, the Swan Princess. There's apparently a ton of these. I've discovered that on Amazon Prime that there's five sequels to this, and most of them have come out in the last few years. I guess my wife watched this growing up or something. I never watched it. I don't know what it is. It's not my thing at all. But I own it. Moving along. Surf's Up. Never seen it. Never showed it to my kids. Don't know where it came from. But I own it. Then we got Superman Doomsday. This is an animated film from about 10 years ago that's a very simplified version of the Death of Superman storyline as well as the Reign of the Superman. Highly simplified uh, throughout the whole thing as to how it works. It's, it's all right. It's not as good as you want it to be. They... I guess they kind of have like a cap that these have to be an hour and 15 minutes or something like that. And so then it just feels so trimmed down unnecessarily. There's some good things in it. There's also some weird animation choices in the way they did things. Uh, then we got Super 8. J.J. Abrams' only film based off an original story that he came up with. And I guess the way it came together is that he was pitched a couple of ideas to Steven Spielberg, one about some little kids shooting videos on a Super 8 camera, and one of them about a train with some creature getting out. And Spielberg talked to him to make them into one movie combined together. I don't know how well that worked out entirely. I enjoyed the movie enough, but it's not one that I ever want to go back to. It plays so much uh, homage to some past things. Um, that it, it feels kind of gets lost in the mix. And it feels like what this is going for, Stranger Things did a lot better. So if you like Stranger Things and want a little bit more of something like Stranger Things and haven't seen Super 8, check out Super 8. Um, but that's, yeah, that was kind of my take on it. A little bit disappointed. There's some good special features on the making of it, some stories behind all that. <sighs> then a movie that's not the prequel to this movie. This is Home Again is not a sequel to this one, even though it has Candace Bergen and the word home in the title followed by an A word and Reese Witherspoon. But Sweet Home Alabama, a movie that my wife used to put to, put on before bed for about two years straight. Uh, <laughs> literally every night she would put this movie on for a very long period of time. So I've seen it many, 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 many many times. It's charming. It's pleasant. I have no negative. I have no issues with it. If she's going to do that with a movie, might as well be that one that I enjoy. Next up, Swordfish. To my knowledge, I believe this is Hugh Jackman's first movie after X-Men. So X-Men came out and it kind of like springboarded him. Like people are like, who is this Hugh Jackman fellow? Let's put him in more stuff. So I put him in this movie Swordfish that's, I, I enjoyed it enough. I saw it in the theater. I have a bunch of nostalgic memories for seeing it. But it really, it's kind of claim to fame as this kind of weird, wacky performance from John Travolta. A first starring leading man role for Hugh Jackman after he'd kind of made his A-list. Overly stylized production. And really, it's claim to fame is that they were making the movie. And it's for the most part, it feels like a PG-13, maybe hard PG-13 type movie. A couple of things are a little bit violent in it. But for some reason, they wanted to go for an R rating. And they decided that they wanted to have Halle Berry nude in it. And so they went to her and they went, hey, we want you to do a nude scene in this. And she said, no. And then they went, we'll give you $300,000. And she went, okay. And then it's one of the most gratuitous nude scenes you'll ever see in a movie ever. Just out of the blue. She's just sitting there reading a newspaper. Hugh Jackman walks up and she goes, whoop. And she's topless just because they wanted it in the movie. That's this movie's claim to fame, Swordfish. You know, classy there. Classy, classy.
Next up, we've got The Sword and the Stone. Another movie I think people just gave to us. I don't know. Like, we didn't buy this one. I'm not quite sure where it came from exactly. I've never actually seen this one. So I'll put this one on the list to show my kids since I need to see it. I, maybe I've seen it. I don't, I, haven't, I don't have, like, distinct memories of watching it. Moving along to one of the great trilogies of our time <laughs> taken. Or at least one movie that's really good and enjoyable and, like, just kind of for some reason popped above that action thriller genre that everyone seemed to like this one, even though it, it's not really better than the genre. It's very much just distinctly a type of movie, but plays so perfectly to the fears and fantasies of dads that it just kind of worked with Liam Neeson at just the right performance at the right age at the right time in the right way. And then the two sequels that are inferior. I like the genre, so I like them enough. Uh, Liam Neeson's always watchable in these types of things. These two, just the this director, Olivia, Olivia Megatron. I'll call him Megatron because he's a villain against action movies. But um, they're watchable enough, directed horribly. They'd be so much better if anyone else directed them, including me. Get me to direct Taken 4. Next up, Take the Lead, a movie I've never seen with Antonio Banderas dancing with... I don't know who. Must be my wife's movie. I've never seen her watching it. Next up, Tall Tale. I remember the trailers for this when I was growing up and remember the cast and everything. I've never seen it. It's unopened. Maybe it's my wife's. That's going to be a recurring theme as next up, The Taming of the Shrew, another one I've definitely never seen, have no interest in seeing. I guess Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton starring together. That's fun and interesting piece of little film history right there. I've never seen it. Not of interest to me at all. But my wife, of course, is interested. Then we've got Teen Wolf 1 and 2. So the first one's kind of an 80s classic, Michael J. Fox. I believe it was filmed before Back to the Future, but they held it until after the Back to the Future came out, which probably helped it become much more iconic than it otherwise would have been because of how successful Back to the Future was. And then fun fact, the second one stars Jason Bateman for, for 15 years. Uh, I mean, from my early childhood of knowing that he was in the sequel to it until Arrested Development, that's all I knew Jason Bateman from. Like, I don't know anything that Jason Bateman did in the 90s. Like, it was literally from my memory of Jason Bateman is he was in this and then he's a dad of a teenager in Arrested Development. And so that's a, the only fun kind of fact about that one. But, um, yeah, if you haven't seen the first Teen Wolf, you got to see the first one. From there, we've got two Thor movies. Um, I, the first one's kind of passable, decent MCU stuff. Great actors doing uh, okay story. For a Kenneth Branagh movie, I kind of just wanted more out of it. And the second one, I think, is the weakest and the most forgettable of all of the MCU films. So I've got both of them. One's better than the other. And we got uh, 310 to Yuma. Directed by James Mangold. He did... Um, Copland back in the 90s with Sylvester Stallone. It's a really cool movie. And then he's done the last two Wolverine movies. Of course, Logan being now beloved and everything. But he did this one, a little bit uh, underappreciated Western remake from 10 years ago with Russell Crowe and Christian Bale and then uh, uh, Mark Foster, or Ben Foster. I was thinking Mark Forster, the director. Ben Foster's the villain giving an amazing performance in a movie full of a-list amazing actors giving amazing performances. So if you haven't seen this one, you like Westerns, you got to check this one out. It's a very cool little movie. Next up, hey, look, look what reappeared. This time we're talking about Time Cop, probably Van Damme's best movie. Just overall, more action movie than a martial arts movie. Got a little martial arts in there, but time travel, action, just a nice, slick 90s action movie with a great concept, executed just right at just the right time in his career. So very fun, enjoyable movie. That this is a if you want an introduction to Van Damme, pick up this Blu-ray set. These these two movies are probably the nice, uh, very good way to kind of show off his career. Then Top Gun, that definitive 80s classic that we're getting a sequel to in a couple of years for some reason. So I like everyone else, I love Top Gun. Fun movie, enjoyable charming. It's a very much a product of its time, but such a great product of its time that it ages really nicely. Still works to this day. Um, and I had the I had the soundtrack to it on vinyl growing up, so I listened to the soundtrack to it all the time. And I was dumb. I was pretty stupid all the way up until about 15 minutes ago when I was shooting this video and I got a lot smarter. But growing up, I was stupid. And so I didn't know that 
Oh, excuse me. My thought was Tom Cruise started in the movie. That means Tom Cruise is singing all the songs on the soundtrack. That's what I believe. And I believe the girl lead lady was singing Take My Breath Away. And so I was like, wow, Tom Cruise is a great singer. I'm stupid. <laughs> Next up. Uh, I have all three Toy Story movies, but right here I've only got two of the Toy Story movies. Obviously, the kicked off the um, uh, kicked off this is CGI animated computer animated films. Um, one of the highest rated trilogies of all time. Two of them have 100 percent around tomatoes. They are phenomenal movies and they have great special features, especially the first one, because it was the first computer animated film. There's a lot of history of where how the movie came into existence and they show you kind of the working, the rewriting of the script, how Woody used to be a, like a really unpleasant character that they had to like fine tune to make him better throughout the version. So some very cool special features on that one. Next up, Tommy Boy. Um, kind of the definitive Chris Farley, David Spade movie. They had some other ones that they did together. This is the good one. This is the one that you got to see that, you know, everyone my age loved growing up. That was so funny that we quoted all the time to each other. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just sad to obviously know that Chris Farley died over 20 years ago, which is really crazy to think about. Next up, we've got Total Recall, a Paul Verhoeven, Schwar Arnold Schwarzenegger movie based off a of Philip K. Dick piece of writing, which makes for one crazy movie that um, I, yeah, I love this movie. Um, yeah, such a cool, ultra violent, mind trippy sci fi movie that came together that you couldn't have made this at almost any other period of time. It works. It, it works on some levels just because you got Arnold in there and the Paul Verhoeven with the wacky, insane ideas of Philip K. Dick all tied together for just a very unique type of movie that then they remade into a very bland, streamlined PG-13 movie. Then we got Traffic, a Steven Soderbergh Oscar bait movie that won a bunch of Oscars that uh, helped me rethink the drug war when I saw it 17 years ago. I guess it came out in 2000, right? Yeah, it came out 17 years. Wow, I'm getting old. But uh, yeah, very good movie. If you haven't seen this one, uh, it's actually a very interesting drama about how the drug trade and drug laws affect different people and the hypocrisy and all of it. Fascinating, great cast all around. Next up, we've got Transformers. Uh, I'm not, a, like I said many times, I'm not a big fan of the Michael Bay Transformers movies, any of them. But the first one's certainly the best of the bunch. It has some really cool things in it. You can see why they became a franchise and why a lot of people do love them. Uh, not necessarily my thing, but um, still a very enjoyable movie. There's got to be a version with more special features than this one, though. It doesn't have much on it. Next up, we have got... The Transporter. I've owned several different copies of that. I, this one's unopened, but that's because my previous copies got stolen, so I bought a cheap copy of it. Uh, just a solid Jason Statham action vehicle is what it is. Another one from Luke Besson and his kind of machine where he cr started cranking out movies left and right, action movies uh, for about 15 years there. Um, and this is one of them. And uh, it's enjoyable enough, passable enough. Uh, I like it enough. Not great type of movie. That's some for some reason had two sequels, a TV show and a reboot, fourth movie in the series. I'm fascinated that there's so much stuff from the transporter. None of them have even been all that successful. Then, if you're counting movies, this is a four movie set, four different Tremors movies all in one set. The first one's really good, um, as just kind of an interesting take on kind of fun comedy action horror about these creatures underground in the small city with Kevin Bacon. I really like the first one. The second one's not too bad either, and it starts getting really ridiculous going into the third, and the fourth one's like a prequel set 100 years in the past, but the same family's been in the community. It just doesn't make a whole lot. It's getting silly. And then there's the fifth one I've never even bothered to see in a TV show. I never bothered to see. But, um, yeah, the first one, if you haven't seen the first Tremors, I'd highly recommend checking it out. It's it's a fun time. Watch with some friends. Don't watch it by yourself. But, um, yeah, that's my recommendation. Moving along, we've got Tron, the original one. Um, bad story about how I got this one. Um, we rented it and forgot we rented it and never returned it. So this is like taken from a Blockbuster and it was the only copy of Blockbuster in North Austin for a little while. And then we took it, never returned it and had to pay a bunch of money to keep it. But um, yeah, for this re reason, we have this one. Man, a bunch of people didn't get to go see it right before um, Tron... Legacy came out. Is that what it's called? Tron Legacy? Is that right? Um, so, whoops. But I, I, Tron's an interesting movie. It's a quirky movie that has a certain charm to it. I've never thought it was a great movie or a particularly good movie. Just 
the cons the, the visual design and things were much cooler than the actual plot. So yeah. Next up, Ben Stiller's classic Tropic Thunder. Um, I really enjoyed this movie. It's fun enough, entertaining enough. I think Ben Stiller's a very good filmmaker that we know him as the guy that was in way too many comedies for about 10 years, but he's actually a talented filmmaker and writer that I wish he would do more of that when he has kind of ideas, he could deliver really solid stuff. One of them being Tropic Thunder. That's a uh, great cast, great scenarios, a bunch of, a bunch of, a bunch of really wonderful things, but I don't watch it all that often. My wife doesn't like it, but I thoroughly enjoy it. Next up, we've got Troy, a Greek epic without the mythology and uh, not just none of the magic you'd think a movie with Brad Pitt, Eric Bana, Orlando Bloom in a Greek epic. None of the magic you would think it would have, but still decent, but still yeah, disappointing at the same time. Now, time back to my Lion King at the drive-in theater. True Lies. True Lies. Um, one of my favorite Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. Solid uh, James Cameron's, I think, only just... Uh, I not think. His only straight-up action movie. Just a cool movie. Maybe gets bogged down a little bit in the middle, but just a great, solid action movie that just today they announced that they might be working on a TV show out of it with Mick G working on it. Not so crazy about that. Now here's the thing. No special features really, no no good ones. Like, hey, you can have subtitles in French. And there's no Blu-ray release. So ridiculous. Like the fact that, oh, digitally mastered in THX, that's awesome. Back 15 years ago, where's my Blu-ray for this? Where, I probably shouldn't have done that because I don't want to crack this. But literally in an interview uh, a couple weeks ago when they released T2 and 3D, James Cameron was talking about why he hasn't released True Lies on Blu-ray, and he stated it's because he's working on Avatar movies. Like, yeah, it's on the back burner until I finish all these Avatar movies. So we're not going to get a proper release for this era of movies of True Lies ever? Because by 2025, when he's done with Avatar movies, we'll skip over Blu-rays entirely. Why would we skip over a Blu-ray edition of True Lies? James Cameron, moron. Next up, two weeks notice, um, back to common theme once again of Hugh Grant and Sandra Bullock movies. Here you've got them in a movie together. I need to rewatch this one. I haven't watched it in forever. I probably didn't buy this one because it's full screen edition and I'm not a weirdo, but um, I don't really remember if I like this one or not. I don't have too many thoughts. I just, other if I'm going to watch a movie with one of these two people, I'll watch one of those other movies with these two people. So this is just kind of one of those ones that's out there. So maybe I like it more than I remember. I don't know. As you can see, we're almost to the end. Ah, if you're still watching, uh, type in the comment section, Red Apple. That have some secret code word for the people that have made it this far into this deal. Woo! I, li I really have done this in one setting with these hot lights on me, and I think I'm losing my mind at this point in time. I think I'm, I don't know, got to be over three hours in the filming. I think this is the longest I've ever talked straight about anything, so. <laughs> Woo! And my nose has been killing me. I'm sure you've noticed my, I'm itching my nose a lot. Next up, Terminator Anthology. Uh, all the Terminator movies up until Term Terminator Jenny Smith. Uh, as I've said many times, Terminator 1 and 2 are phenomenal, favorite films of all time type things. And then everything after Terminator 2, to me, is just fan fiction. It's not part of continuity. It's just, hey, someone that likes these movies wants to tell a story in that universe, but it's not actually part of the canon. That's my take on it. The anthology set has some great special features on there. You gotta, when you buy Terminator 2, there's, you can normally buy it for like five bucks and you can find a dirt cheap version of it. Um, so be sure to get one that has a ton of great special features and you can get like so cheap. They're at Best Buy on sale all the time. Um, so same with the first one and two, one and two have some great special features you want to check out. Next up, That Thing You Do. If you haven't seen That Thing You Do, it is such a charming, pleasant little movie that Tom Hanks wrote and directed. He doesn't actually star in it. He's in it, but he doesn't star in it. He's uh, he's more kind of like a B-level character and, it, and the, the band is the leads in it. He's like a manager guy, producer guy that kind of helps them along the way. But they had a real charming song. In the song they wrote for it, uh, I think it's from the guys that did uh, Stacy's Mom. I think they're the, the songwriters for it. It's a such a, it's a, so good that it actually, you 
fully feels like it is like one of those one hit wonder songs from like the around the year 1960. But even it's a movie that you watch and you look at the cast and you're like, oh, it's that guy, it's that guy, it's that guy, and Charlize Theron is in it and things like that. So real pleasant one. If you haven't seen that one, you got to go check it out. Next up, UHF Weird Al's movie. Um, so I grew up a huge Weird Al fan, so I grew up a huge fan of this movie. And I loved it even before I'd seen a lot of the movies that it was referencing. So, like, my first memories of Rambo were from this, not from seeing Rambo and some stuff like that. And um, I don't know if I'd seen the uh, Indiana Jones movies before I saw um, <laughs> this movie. But um, with time, it, in certain ways, this one aged better and it aged really badly in other ways. And it's an interesting movie because a movie like this wouldn't get made now it would be a series of sketches on YouTube with the parody nature of it referencing things that are very timely that's what you would do on YouTube so this is a movie that could never be made today or never would be made today so fascinating little interesting piece of history and it came out summer 1989 which was like Batman Lethal Weapon 2 Star Trek 5 Ghostbusters 2 so it bombed at the box office because of the competition but in its own way it's kind of just as it's not just as remembered but by its group of people it became a cult classic that certainly found its audience on home video next up my favorite M. Night Shyamalan movie Unbreakable a movie way ahead of its time because the superhero films hadn't really blown up yet the way they have now and so this is a movie that would be interesting that if he'd made this one like in the year 2012 as opposed to the year 2000 how it would have been received but I just love this one the nature of it the themes about potential and wasting potential and a sadness in life that as, as you get older you can resonate with some of them more as you kind of think through what you've done with your life and stuff and so it's a movie that I loved when it first came out loved a few years after it and then re-watching it fairly recently uh, when a certain movie came out this year uh, that I just thoroughly enjoyed <coughs> excuse me next up We've got Underworld, the trilogy, the first three films. I guess there's not a trilogy, there's like five of them or something like that now. But so the first three movies in the Underworld series, um, I've never been a big fan of it. They're like enjoyable enough action, enjoyable enough vampire stuff, charming enough in a sense, but they're not all that great in a different sense. So, but I own them and I've rewatched them enough times. My wife is breaking and she wants to be on camera, but you don't want to be on camera. You just wanted to bring some of the movies yeah, I missed. You're editing this. Right? I'm, I'm not editing. I'm, this is going to be in there. You're in the video now. Oh, sorry. Um, I just found those. Oh, you found them? And Larissa's borrowing How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Okay, so also if you're trying to keep track, if you're that person counting, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, I own that one. Larissa's got it. Uh, another Matthew McConaughey one. I... I, I really like that movie. That's I thoroughly enjoy that movie. Liked it. I've always liked it. Um, some movies I kind of missed along the way in my alphabetical um, thing here. Deep Blue Sea, a very classic shark movie. Down and kind of gritty, grounded. No, it's not. It's a ridiculous shark movie. We uh, watched it like a month ago or something like that. Very solid uh, moment there for Samuel L. Jackson in this one. It's got Thomas Jane in it, so that's a lot of fun. Then... Those Rambo movies I was talking about that we missed. Here it is. Here's the set. My wife brought it in here. This is a very cool little deal. It's got some... Um, there's some special features on it, but they're not as good as you want them to be. They're, it's not, like, as much or as strong. Like, if, this is a movie. This is a series now that we're 35 years old that they can do some better stuff. Uh, do some cool stuff with it. Moving along. Oh, sorry about my nose and the itching. It's driving me nuts. I guess that's what happens when you sit down and talk and kill your immune system. Next up, we've got Unstoppable. They come a movie that, it did well, but it kind of went a little bit, excuse me, now I'm burping too. A little bit underappreciated, I felt. A Tony Scott film with Chris Pine, Denzel Washington, for just a very solid trained thriller that just works on all the levels it needs to work. Next up, we've got The Untouchables. If you haven't seen The Untouchables, you gotta see The Untouchables. Cool 30s mobster movie. Uh, during Prohibition, uh, Kevin Costner and uh, I mean, crazy kind of casting. Kevin Costner, uh, Robert De Niro, Sean Connery. Um, who's the other one? Andy Garcia. So a great cast of actor. Well, actually, it's right there on the bottom. You can read that. There you go. Um, so got to check that one out um, if you, you like that kind of thing. Next up, my next Van Damme collection of movies. Second copy of Time Cop. That's great. Um one of these movies is good, and then three of them are not. Wait, did I say one? I'm losing. 
I'm losing it. These two are really good. Those are two of the best kind of, this one's directed, this one's directed by John Woo, mentioned him several times in here. So probably his best directed movie, also solid kind of most dangerous game type story. Then Time Cop, we talked about that one. This one, I think it's better than people give it credit court for because it's intentionally stupid. It knows that it's dumb. It's making fun of itself. Then the quest, he directed it. It's actually bad. And it has that James Bond that I can't remember his name that I... Let me see. Let me, I'm going to embarrass my... Roger Moore. Roger Moore. Finally, two hours later after forgetting Roger Moore's name. How do you forget Roger Moore? It's, it's He just died, too. That's sad. Next up, we got Valkyrie. World War II movie with Tom Cruise, directed by Brian Singer. Great all-around cast. A movie that seemed to be underappreciated. I, I, I missed it in theaters. Finally, eventually watched it. I was like, that's a really good movie. I'm surprised more people don't talk about that one. I think maybe the... Maybe the tones, not the tone or the the look of it, the style of it is a little bit off given the, because uh, it has a little bit of a gloss to it. And it's a story that feels like that shouldn't be gloss. And so I think maybe that's why it wasn't received as well. Next up, Varsity Blues came out when I was in high school, was filmed right around where I was going to high school, right here in Central Texas. Um, so I have all sorts of nostalgia for this one from when I was in high school, even though it doesn't reflect any of my experiences in high school as a football player as being popular, going to parties, drinking or any of the stuff that goes on in this movie. That was not my high school experience at all, but still a movie that reminds me of high school, even though all these people are like 10 years older than me. I was in high school watching this movie about them in high school and it's like, they're like 28 years old. This is ridiculous. Next up, A Walk to Remember. I think I saw this one once. I think the most memorable thing about this movie is that um, Switchfoot's A Dare You To Move is in this movie before it was a big hit because it was on their album before the album that was a big hit and they repackaged it and re-recorded it and stuff. And I think the original version's in this. Fun fact. Next up, Waiting for Guffman, one of those Christopher Guest movies. The, it's like the people that worked on um, uh, This Is Spinal Tap, except for the director of that one, basically made a whole series of those types of movies, and one of them is Waiting for Guffman. They're all really funny, fun. A lot of it's improvised, and it's kind of mock you documentary stuff, so pretty cool. Then we got... <laughs> walk hard the Dewey Cox story this one's there's just my biggest memories of this one are the fact that my wife watched it before I did and it's like a hard R shows wieners in it and stuff and she watched it before I did and was like uh you're not gonna believe what I accidentally watched today you'll probably really like it but uh I can't believe I watched the whole thing so that's my biggest memories of that one next up Wally delightful little robot environmentalist movie um I enjoyed it. Uh, I, I just more respect respect of the movie, liked certain things about it. Very Pixar's ability to kind of tell stories that you wouldn't think you could tell is quite impressive. Next up, we've got Watchmen. Um, this is like the crappiest version of the DVD that you can get is the one that I have. There's ver there's like three different versions of the movie that are different lengths. There's this one that's the short one. Then there's one that's the extended cut that's like. I don't know how much longer it is, but it's a good bit longer with has more footage. And then there's the ultimate edition of it that has stuff that's in the graphic novel that's like a cartoon thing that's woven in throughout the graphic novel that's incorporated into another version of it. Get any of those versions. Don't get the crappy one that I got. Um, it's a, pe Some people hate it because they just don't like Zack Snyder. Some people hate it because they don't think you can translate Watchmen to the screen. Uh, I'm not really a purist in those regards. I can respect the person that says you can't trace, trace Watchmen to the screen because of the nature of what it was and what Alan Moore was trying to do. Respect all that. I'm not going to try and argue with you if that's your kind of your school because I, I see where you're coming from. I just I'm, I just see things differently. I can respect it for what it is. In which case, it's it's a good, not great comic book movie that's kind of dark. <laughs> Next up, Waterboy. Talking about Adam Sandler and his kind of big career Boom in the late 90s after The Wedding Singer, which we're going to get to in just a moment. Um, one of those movies that I always thought was surprised at how much it stuck with certain people and quoting along with it, because it seemed like the dumbest of the movies in this period. I was never into Adam Sandler as the voice guy. Where we talk, uh, like, talks in funny voices and stuff. Like, whenever he does that stuff, I just hate it. And um, That's my boy. And I never thought any of that stuff that he did was funny. And that's what he does. Bobby Boucher. I don't like it. Wedding Crashers, I own it. Don't really ever watch it. Not really my thing. But one that's more interesting for the supporting cast of it, once again, you've got 
Rachel McAdams as the girl lead in it, and you've got Bradley Cooper as the other guy in it. So a movie whose supporting cast, once again, is so good that it elevates the movie, and probably one of the reasons why that movie was such a big surprise hit is because of how talented the cast was for the movie at just the right moment in time of the boom for Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn as the leads, and then the uprise of Rachel McAdams and Bradley Cooper and those types of people. Next up, the one we were just talking about, my favorite Drew Barrymore and Adam Sandler movie, both as individuals and together, um, The Wedding Singer. Just a delightful, fun little movie that's a love story, romantic comedy, a legitimately fun funny comedy and just the 80s vibe to it makes it just gives it a vibe to it which is interesting because the movie takes place in the 80s it came out in the late 90s so it's only 10 years after when it's taking place but at the time it felt so ancient and now this movie's 20 years old when this movie came out the 80s was only 10 years old so it's funny to think the 90s are twice as old compared to the wedding anyway those thoughts that i have running through my head all the time of stuff like that oh my nose i'm almost done i'm so sorry everybody Oh, or, but thank you for chiming in this whole time. My hard drive is actually about to get filled up. I better start talking faster. What happens in Vegas? For a long time, my wife kept telling me how good this movie was, and we had it, and I'd walk in and wake up in the middle of the night. She was watching and stuff. Finally, I actually watched it like a month ago, and I was right. It's not good. They're really unlikable people that are selfish, and I don't, I don't understand the appeal. Next up, where eagles dare. Um, Clint Eastwood, classic war movie. I haven't seen it in 20 years. I really don't. I barely remember it, unfortunately. But I own it. Next up, When Harry Met Sally. Classic Meg Ryan, Billy Crystal comedy from the late, late 80s. And uh, just a, a solid rom-com. A different type of rom-com from most it, that works on a kind of its own level. I hadn't seen it. I owned it, but I hadn't seen it for a while. I finally watched it a couple years back. and was like, this really is quite good. This is a neat little movie. Next one, one my wife was really into that I never saw when it first came out, got married and watched it a few times with her. We actually watched it just two weeks ago. Wicker Park, weird one of these uh, thriller movies that try to have the twist ending told out of chronicle order, order like a lot of movies in the early zeros. Uh, it doesn't really work. I don't think it's, it's, it's so, like you look at the cover and you think it's a 90s erotic thriller and it's, well, you even see sexy thriller. So it seems like it's a movie that was supposed to come out in the early 90s starring Sharon Stone, but it came out 10 years after that and it's rated PG-13. So it's like an erotic thriller minus the erotic. So weird. Next up, actually a really good movie. If you haven't seen While You Were Sleeping, maybe... Finish this video. There's only like two minutes left. Then go pick up While You're Sleeping. Delightful romantic comedy from John Turtletop. He's the guy that did the National Treasure movies. And just very fun, charming, funny. Peak Bill Pullman. Peak Sandra Bullock. Uh, just all around great cast, side characters. Everything about this one is, is delightful. If you haven't seen it, you gotta go see While You Were Sleeping. It's weird you haven't seen it. Next up, Wreck-It Ralph. A lot of people like this movie. I like this movie. I'm not as bonkers about it as some people, but it's still very enjoyable. Solid movie. Kids love it. And if my kids, if there's one I gotta rewatch re too many times because I got kids, that's not a bad one to have. Next up, we got two X-Files movies. The first one, much better than the second one. I actually have only, I never rewatched this one. I own it, but I never rewatched it. I saw it in the theater and I was like, that was such a weird choice to go in that direction. If you're going to do a standalone movie, why would you do do it like a stand? That was weird. Um, but this one, actually quite good. It's It very much is ties into the mythology of the TV show. And so if you're not caught up on the TV show, it, I don't know that it stands alone all that well. But still very good. Uh, kind of at the peak of X-Files. And so it feels like a big budget piece of the series but or it's big budget episode but at the same time still really good because x-files is really good one and at its best next up we've got four ah uh, no please stop i'm almost done next up we've got four x-men movies four of them uh another one that kicked off the comic book movie genre our modern era of comic book movies uh of those ones right there, two of those are really good and two are really bad. I don't know why I own them. I think this is actually one of the very first Blu-rays I ever bought, X-Men Origins Wolverine. It's it's really bad. It's 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 one of those movies you rewatch it and you're just shocked at how bad it is. And the first two, in certain ways, haven't aged great. Uh, in other ways, have aged wonderfully. That's really cool that 17 years later, Hugh Jackman was still playing the character. And there's some great special features on some of those ones. All right, where does our final two? <sighs> Pen Ultimate. 
Movie in my collection, you've got mail. Uh, I think the last, I don't think they've done anything since this movie. It was almost 20 years old of You've Got Mail. It's actually a remake. I forget what it's a remake of, but a charming little movie about bookstores and people and corporate America versus small, a bunch of different stuff explored. And it's kind of fun. And it's charming because they're charming and a, a little fun little movie. I'm not in love with it. And it's fun to look at this cover because it's so, I guess, airbrushed at the time you call it photoshop these days and they look ridiculous <laughs> with how much they've been made up and our last movie of the day my last no scratch of the day zoolander the movie came out september 2001 and so it didn't do very well at the box office because no one was going to the movies because they were scared they were going to die but a real wacky zany quotable Ben Stiller movie with this high concept insanity. I love it so much. I never saw the second one because I didn't want to see the have it ruined for me and watch like, oh, 50 year old Ben Stiller. Bad idea. Bad move. The first one, however, worked really nicely. Another one of those kind of up and coming movies for Owen Wilson. Just a, a solid piece of entertainment. So there you have it. And if you notice how sweaty my armpits are, I thought I'd say that you probably picked up on it by now. There's enormous circles. Like, that is that is appallingly gross. If you've made it to this point that you were able to see that, I commend you for your commitment. This is the magnum opus of my channel. <laughs> the longest video I'm sure I will ever do. But I'm still going. If you're new to my channel, please consider clicking that subscribe button. I do movie reviews. I do ranking videos. Sometimes I sit here for four hours straight. Are we four and a half, almost five hours, maybe five hours? I'm even, I can't, I can barely even put thoughts together. And I think I just rubbed my nose. I thought I said I was done, but I, I'm not. But I do lots of different stuff talking about movies, but I don't want to just talk about movies and itch my nose. I want to talk about movies and itch my nose with you. So please consider clicking that subscribe button. Join me in the comment section. And if you're tracking on along, counting the number of movies I talked about, how many movies do I own? Let me know down below in the comment section. My guess, I believe, I think was 287. How close was I? Thank you for watching.